Okay. All right, well, good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming back to the second day of the conference. We have another great program this morning, and we're going to start off with another panel. The panel is titled Public or Private, Differences in Capital Markets and ESG Regulation. Uh, the panel is going to be moderated by Mike Minnis. And we have three panelists, so John Coates from Harvard Law School, Christian Lloyds from here at the University of Chicago, and Elizabeth Seeger from KKR. I just want to tell you a little bit about our panelists before, uh, before diving into the panel. So John Coates is the John F. Kogan Professor of Law and Economics at Harvard University. He previously served as the Acting Director of the Division of Corporate Finance at the SEC. He's widely recognized as an expert on corporate governance, corporate transactions, and compliance and disclosure processes. Before joining Harvard, he was a partner at Watchell, Lipton, Rosen, and Katz, where he specialized in M&A and helping firms register and sell securities. Christian Lloyds is a Joseph Sondheimer Professor of International Economics, Finance, and Accounting here at the University of Chicago Booth School of Business, where he studies the role of disclosure and transparency in capital markets and other settings, including ESG, um, the economic effects of reporting in standard setting, among other topics. He's also written research on reports research reports for standard setters and engage with regulators on both ESG and capital market disclosure uh, topics. And then finally, Elizabeth Seeger is the Managing Director for Sustainable Investing at KKR, a firm with nearly $500 billion of total assets under management. Um, she, sorry, she joined KKR in 2009 to help oversee the consideration of ESG issues throughout KKR's processes. She has over 20 years of experience working on corporate environmental and social issues and earned a BA with honors from the University of Chicago and then an MBA from uh, the Wharton School. And then finally, our, our uh, moderator is going to be Michael Minnis, who's a professor of accounting here at the University of Chicago and, and a co-organizer for the, for the conference. Uh, before handing it over to Mike, I just want to remind everyone to please turn your mic on if you have a question. That way everyone in the room can hear you and all the folks watching online can hear you as well. So why don't we get started, Mike? All right, thank you all. So this is, a, this is a panel we want to talk about uh, differences in disclosure regulation, and there's lots of things that we could kind of get into here, lots of different avenues, and we kind of isolated into two kind of big components, the capital markets components, the ESG component. Um, but I kind of want to start off with a big picture question here, and then we can get each, each of your thoughts on this. You know, probably a, one of the key defining characteristics of what makes a private company different from a public company is a lack of disclosure. Um, and, and this, in, in the U.S. in particular, um, is one of the few places where it's even kind of hard to even get a list of who private companies are, let alone anything about their financial performance, et cetera. Talk, talk a little bit generally about what your views are on this kind of quiet, kind of quiet regime in the U.S., um, either from a capital markets perspective, an ESG perspective, uh, and what do you think are the kind of the costs and benefits of having such a, having such a regime? John, you want to? Start us off here. Sure, am I, I think I'm on mute. Am I on now? There okay. we go. Uh, Great. Yeah. Um, so uh, this is obviously a big topic. I'll not do it justice, but um, I, I think the, the the core of evolved modern framing is something you heard about from the commissioner last night and that we heard a little bit about yesterday in Michael's presentation, a kind of basic trade-off between investor protection ideas, disclosure as a form, mandatory disclosure, using a comparable framework with audited mandates and a, a, a checklist of items and liability um, as a way of protecting investors, which comes with costs, but also presumably lowers the cost of capital for the people who comply. So that's like the basic, simple economic trade-off. Um, and I think there's still a lot of value to that, um, particularly as you think about investors as individuals, retail, which was, of course, a major component of the market in 1933 and was gradually diminishing until GameStop suddenly got everybody <laughs> to pick up their phones again. So I know there is like a little flurry of interest in retail again, which may change some of what I'm about to say. But I, I, I think that the gradual diminishment of retail and the belief that institutional investors can protect themselves and don't need the government to set that trade-off has been a major contributor in the background to some of the things that Michael covered yesterday, a gradual deregulation of private equity and private capital raising more generally. Um, at the same time, of course, there's still major 
listed companies um, that were already public. And I, one thing I'll just note in passing that, that actually Christian a long time ago worked on a little bit and I've looked at from time to time, most public companies choose to be public. I mean, like it, they could actually go dark right now. Um, there's, a, there's a mandatory set of regulations when they sell securities, but once they're listed, uh, the only thing that's sort of keeping them in the SEC regime is the listing. If they're prepared to give up the listing, then the only other rule is they have to have more than 300 record holders. And as you probably all know, the way ownership works these days is record owners are not usually very numerous. I just looked at the largest IPOs and DSPACs from last year. None of them are even close to 300 <coughs> record holders. They have to report that in their 10K. So they're all choosing to be public companies because they want to. And likewise, there are lots of private, truly private companies in the sense that I think you would think who list bonds and then end up having to comply with the SEC's disclosure team. That's not a, that's not a binding choice. They're, they're choosing uh, a debt instrument. They have lots of other choices. And so they're, all right, so I say all that because I, like, I actually think reveal preference tells us that that trade-off reflects you know, currently um, a lot of companies at scale, particularly if they want liquid markets for their securities, think the disclosure regime with all of its cost and burdens and governance intrusion and so on is, is clearly worth it. One other thing, you know, Michael, yeah, the presentation yesterday was great, except, of course, one data point that's important for everybody to keep in mind is last year's IPO boom was the biggest, depending on how you measure it exactly, even without SPACs, and then you throw in SPACs and it becomes even bigger, and nothing regulatory changed to lead up to that. Jobs Act was already well in place. So whatever your intuitions are about the role of regulation or the, the question basically that you're asking me, I don't think that really is a first order explanation of the ways of going public and private that we see. That's really a, a, a set of choices about the trade-off that I just sketched. Now, I'll say two other quick things that are more controversial. Um, I think when the 33 Act was passed, it's important to remember that the Soviet Union was new and appealing to a large part of the world, including huge percentages of the population of the United States. Super majorities of the people in Wisconsin wanted to go full bore socialist. The Fortune magazine readership, Fortune magazine readership, 40 to 50% of them thought socialism was a reasonable choice. And the 33 Act and the 34 Act were partly about investor protection. That's like their core frame. But frankly, they were also a political tool. They were a political tool to increase, increase transparency to the general American public into the way that basic capitalist organizations function, lower the suspicion, lower the paranoia, lower the belief that there were a bunch of people like causing the depression that people were living through. All right, I say all that because that actually is baked into our law. Our law says rules for the protection of investors and in the public interest. And then there's this and in the public interest component, which gives the SEC legal authority to do more than can be strictly based on that trade-off between investor protection and, and capital costs. Um, and from time to time, the SEC has used it. I, the current chair is not pointing to it, but there is definitely building latent demand out there among certainly the Democratic Party for more efforts in that way. I think it would probably personally be a mistake anytime soon for that to be the frame around which disclosure regulations are being passed. Um, but last thing I'll say, most private companies, you heard this from Michael yesterday, um, are able to raise the capital and remain private as they do only because the SEC or Congress, some combination over time, has treated the dispersed economic ownership on top of them as legally irrelevant. So we go back to record holders, right? We don't count the beneficial holders. You could. And if you did, you went up through LPs to pension fund beneficiaries. Almost every private equity fund would be a public company or all the portfolio companies owned by that fund and, uh, and down the line. So legally, there is this gigantic possibility of a reversion to a very different world in which most companies would be subject to a disclosure regime. There is some real value in transparency, in disclosure, separate from investor protection. I alluded to the political dynamic. That's part of, I think, why Europe has taken the approach of any company above a certain size has to make some basic public information available. 
I think it's why the largest PE complexes, and Elizabeth can speak to maybe whether she uh, sees this at all in her world, but you know, Carlisle publishes a climate report voluntarily for itself, committed to net zero before most companies even knew what that meant, and actually currently surveys the carbon footprint of its portfolio companies, totally voluntarily. Why do they do that? Why do they spend that money? It's partly, you know, kind of direct investor demand, but I also think it's partly these legitimacy benefits that I'm alluding to here. And I, you know, the, the takeaway from this is the private company world should think about in-between solutions. It doesn't have to be a choice between you disclose everything in the way that the SEC makes IBM do, or you disclose nothing. There's lots of in-between uh, choices there. And uh, I, I think increasingly with private equity and private company dominance in the economy growing ever steadily, notwithstanding last year's IPO boom, I think there may be uh, real virtues for thoughtful private company leaders to think about some of those in-between ideas. I'll stop. Christian? Sure. It's always a tough act to follow. <laughs> It seems clear that disclosure and committing to transparency has clear and substantial benefits, and there's sort of work on that, especially when it comes to raising capital. But many of these benefits can probably be generated through voluntary commitments. And so the important question to ask is what can sort of a mandate do that you couldn't do through voluntary commitments? And one of the things that a mandate does, it creates this sort of credibility because you, you commit to having to provide this information for um, a foreseeable future. But again, and it brings the enforcement regime with it. That's, in my mind, a very important uh, aspect that also is shown in the literature. Now, but again, you can also achieve that by having firms select into that regime. And that's kind of essentially what the US regime is and what um, John was alluding to. Now, what I think is partly a problem of the US regime is that it's so binary. And it's kind of this all or nothing that the public companies have to do a lot and then the private companies do nothing. And I've sort of for years argued that it might be worthwhile thinking about more scaled type of regulation. The second point I would want to make is, <clears throat> and that connects with the dinner speech last night, is that you can think about corporate governance or agency type benefits that you get from um, transparency. But they, I think, are tightly connected to both ownership structure and capital structure. And if you have fairly, you know, a, 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 a proprietorship, then a lot of these problems essentially disappear. So they have a lot to do with what that ownership structure is. And as we're getting more disintermediation in the private space, and we're getting, you know, sort of funneling money and, and small investors into the private space, the more relevant this issue becomes. And that's sort of, I think, what, get, what yesterday in the speech um, was uh, what the commissioner was alluding to. A third bucket is kind of this idea of information spillovers, and there are several people in the room that have worked on these information spillovers. But here it's important to see that they cut both ways, right? You, on one hand, it's clear that providing the sort of transparency and information can um, help other companies figure out investment opportunities, provides valuations, and so on. But at the same time, there is a serious, and Jerry mentioned that last night as a question, for instance, there's a serious issue with proprietary costs. And, um, the paper that Matthias will pr present later is trying to sort of aggregate um, these spillovers and sort of look at both the positive and the negative ones with respect to innovation. I think uh, an important sort of result there is on one hand that you see sort of a reduction in, in innovation, but the more important and, and, and result that I think connects with the conference here is this reallocation from the small private companies to the, uh, to the bigger companies. And yesterday we were hearing how the small companies are so important for innovation. So there are costs to this regime that we need to think about carefully uh, when we're um, sort of thinking about um, a, a mandate. And then maybe the last point related to what um, John was saying, I also um, don't agree with sort of, there's a lot of people who said SOX and a number of other regulations is what's driving firms into the public markets. I don't quite agree with that argument in the sense that I don't think the literature at the time that looked right after SOX was that convincing that there was an effect. I think there was an effect on going dark, but that was a particular sliver of the population of firms. What has happening is because of the 
deregulation on the private side as well as the availability of private capital, what's happening is that the um, benefits of being public and having the liquidity and having access to capital for public companies relative to private company, that wedge has become smaller and smaller. And then what happens is that the regulatory cost at the margin will matter, right? And so it's, it's in that sense that the regulatory costs matter, but it's because we brought down that wedge. And that's been happening in the financial markets, not so much on the regulatory side. Very good. Elizabeth? I'm going to start with a preamble on this one. Um, as you mentioned, well, as mentioned in my bio, I was a University of Chicago undergraduate in environmental studies. And uh, pretty sure I had a nightmare that one day I would be on a panel with a bunch of professors. <laughs> <laughs> well, talking about something I'm only like semi-qualified to talk about. So thank you for letting me live my I'm dream. I'm glad we could bring yeah. your nightmare to reality. Yeah, nightmare to reality. So um, with, with that, I'll say caveat heavily that you know these comments are my own and do not represent the views of KKR. So everybody online listen to that as well. I also want to add a couple of other things about my, my, my role and, and how I'm engaged on this topic that might be relevant to this discussion. So in addition to my role at KKR, um, for those of you who are familiar with the Principles for Responsible Investment, the PRI, I'm also on the Reporting and Assessment Advisory Committee for the PRI. I'm on the Standards Board for SASB, the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board, and have been involved in that organization since it started in 2011, 2012. I'm also the North American Network Chair for the Initiative Klima International, which has 170 private markets investors who have signed up to work with portfolio companies on climate-related issues, including disclosure. So a lot of activity um, that KKR is involved in it, it, as it relates to private markets in the disclosure space, so I have a lot, a lot to say on the topic. Um, as it relates to, and, and I'm going to really stick to the ESG side of things, and, and I have uh, no, no qualifications to, to talk to the regulatory side of things or respond to the commissioner's comments last night. But despite there not being any mandatory requirements in the U.S. on uh, disclosure on ESG performance, there are a lot of pressures for private, privately held companies to do that. Um, and the, the bar is increasing and moving incredibly quickly. Um, and it's, it's leading to a, a place where there's sort of a, you know, an arms race between private equity firms and, and the private equity um, and the portfolio company, companies underneath neath us to collect and report as much data as possible. You mentioned, somebody mentioned Carlyle. Did you mention Carlyle? Yes, KKR has also made a net zero commitment in three of its flagship private markets funds. What does that mean? That means that we actually now have to collect and analyze the greenhouse gas emissions from the portfolio companies, not only once we're invested in the companies, but before we invest in the companies so that we can understand if there is a decarbonization pathway for that company and how much is it gonna cost for us over, over the life of the investment. The good news is there are a lot of voluntary framework, reporting frameworks out there for companies on ESG topics, SASB being one of them, the Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosure being a really important one uh, with which the SEC used in its proposal as a model. Um, but in this um, uh, environment where there's a lot of moving, moving targets, uh, lots of different opinions here, what we're left with is data that um, is certainly incomplete, is not comparable, and it's certainly not cost effective uh, for any of us at the moment as it relates to thinking about how are we going to collect it, how are we going to analyze it. We're all developing our own protocols and approaches, et cetera. Um, and in the absence of real data, and this is, a, I think, a, a bigger problem than people appreciate, in the absence of real data, organizations are making estimates about this. And we see this a lot in greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, in particular, we have a, a number of managers, asset owners making climate-related commitments, net zero commitments. The Net Zero Asset Manager Initiative, for example, I think has 256 signatories who have committed to move their portfolios to, to net zero by 2050. The amount of real data on greenhouse gas emissions is, is not is not going to enable that. So in, in this absence, we have a number of rating agencies making estimates ba based on industry, revenue, um, and that's introducing bad data to the system. So I think there, you know, there's a real opportunity here to do more, but I would, you know, my answer is certainly private companies are, are subject to the expectations here, and, and we are as private equity investors as well. So 
This, this is a great start, and I want to try to make this as conversational as possible amongst us. And, and frankly, I wish we just would have recorded our dinner conversation last night, and then we could have just replayed that for everybody. Uh, maybe we'll just replay it here. So um, let's start back with you, Elizabeth, on some of these issues. Like KKR is interesting because it itself is a public company, but its portfolio companies are private companies. Um, you talked a little bit about the, the we'll think about the ESG space and the, and the reporting. Um, KKR, if you go to their website, and they've got this massive um, ESG disclosure document you've been doing for about a decade, right? You've been there since 2009 and started to introduce that and bring that forward. You talked a little bit about the, the, the pressures. This is a completely voluntary disclosure here. Um, why do you feel compelled to do so? And, and let me think about that from the ESG perspective. Do you feel compelled to report your financial results of your portfolio companies, but you report the ESG side? T talk a little bit about that tension. And, and maybe on that yeah. latter one, that's not fair because you're out of the capital markets. So you already told me you're not going to talk about that. But <laughs> think about that ESG voluntary disclosure and, and there's some of those pressures you feel about doing that. Yeah, so in my role at KKR, um, I, I sort of interact with this ESG disclosure question in a n number of different ways. Uh, one is KKR, a public, publicly traded company. Another as a private equity investor. Another as a, as a lender to private companies. Um, and uh, the other as a advisor to our private companies who are potentially heading toward IPO and preparing them for that. We have a whole exercise around IPO readiness. So a lot of different interactions with this topic. You know, as it relates to KKR as a publicly traded company, or uh, yeah, as a publicly traded company, we started reporting, as you mentioned, in, in 2011 and have been doing it ever since then. In fact, last year in 2021, we produced six different ESG disclosures reports. Uh, climate, I'm not, I'm not even going to remember them all, but, you know, climate action report, our general ESG report, an impact report, um, a special ESG disclosures report aimed specifically at the rating agencies who rate KKR as a publicly traded company, and a SASB report, and I, there must, must be another one in there as well. So a lot of reporting going on. Um, but today is a very different um, environment for ESG data and reporting for us than it was you know, in 2011, um, which was based on 2010 performance. We're really, you know, we, we have a lot of stakeholders, regulators, KKR employees, um, KKR portfolio company management teams, uh, our, our fund investors. We had plenty of reason to be reporting on this even back then in 2011 uh, when we were one of the first ones to, to start doing so. Back then, there were no frameworks. <laughs> we, we spent a lot of time sort of understanding what people thought was material about private equity. My mom was the proofreader. I mean, like, we were like, this was like back in the day. Uh, I, I nixed and continue to nix any smiling people in our reports. You know, it's, this is really, for us, like ESG issues are business issues and need to be managed as business issues and communicated as business issues. So that was really sort of our, our thesis there. Um, today, though, very different environment. Still continue to do the reporting. This next year, we're going to have, a, um, we're going to integrate all of those six reports that I mentioned before. But it actually is driving investment decisions. So we've had our publicly, our, our public shareholders come to our investor relations team, which is, by the way, a wonderful advocate and ally for this work, and say we can't invest in you because MSCI or Sustainalytics has graded you, you know, X, Y, Z, ABC, or whatever the case is. We have to spend a lot of time understanding why that is, figuring out which gaps we can close, which gaps we disagree with, which, by the way, are many. Um, and then our, our new report will be incredibly responsive to what's important to our public shareholders, which includes, by the way, more data, particularly on climate and our, our emissions. Christian, I see you writing some notes. I don't know if you've got a reaction or... Um. I didn't have a direct reaction to this. W one thing that I was going to highlight that I think connects with what Elizabeth was saying is ESG is different from financial reporting in the sense that it has so many audiences that are potentially interested in, in, in those um, <clears throat> data. And the reason this is relevant is sort of, on one hand, I think where some of the pressures Elizabeth is talking about or where they're saying why they um, feel compelled to provide this information is that on one hand, I think the preferences of shareholders have shifted. I mean, there's they're sort of, you know, if you think back to the old mantra that it was just about shareholder value maximization, but I think more and more people have non-financial preferences that play into um, <clears throat> for why they're sort of trying to get more information on, on ESG. 
And secondly, is once you put ESG information out and some of the stakeholders respond to that information, you can get sort of feedback loops back to um, that make this even from a shareholder value perspective or from a firm valuation perspective very material and very relevant, right? So the classic example I gave at the dinner table last night, but that I've, I've given in, in other situations before, is sort of think about sort of like the drinking straws, the plastic straws, right? So if people all of a sudden are very worried about them because they're harmful to the environment and to the animals, then you could imagine how a, a, a small item for a beverage, you know, retailer all of a sudden becomes material because if the customers say we're going to boycott that chain because they still are serving drinks with plastic straws, then it very quickly becomes a business issue. And I think that is something um, that makes it also a lot harder to predict um, how the disclosures, ESG disclosures, what effects they will have uh, once they get provided. And to me, that is actually also one reason where I'm a little bit worried about ESG um, mandates because a lot of these consequences might be unintended and, and not so easily foreseeable, right? So that's, that's another trade-off that I think we need to think about as we think about should we mandate companies to provide this information versus should we let them sort of provide some of the information that they feel like their stakeholders are demanding or their shareholders are demanding. So I, let me build on, on both of their points by reminding folks we already have some um, significant uh, ESG reporting mandated for private companies. So the EPA has a regime that basically picks up any point source that's above specified thresholds, regardless of ownership, then you can go to their website and they put, they put the information up in, as far as I can tell, the most difficult to use fashion possible. Um, but you guys are good enough at scraping and, and coding and so on that you can no doubt turn it into usable information pretty readily. And in theory, it can be aggregated up to the parent company level, although that's a little trickier given inevitable data challenges. But um, so that's out there as a backdrop. And, and that scope one, they, you know, the EPA does not do anything about scope three because for the EPA's purpose, they don't care about scope three. Scope three is a, is only makes sense if you're thinking about an entity and the EPA thinks about the world. And so they, they want all emissions, but they're not really interested in classifying them by who exactly they're connected to. They also, EPA doesn't really care about physical risk, uh, exposure to hurricanes. Um, I mean, I suppose they care, but they, it's not really at the heart of what the agency is about. And so um, the kind of private estimates that Elizabeth was alluding to that are being generated currently are built on the limited disclosures you can get from the EPA. They're then augmented by the voluntary disclosures that companies increasingly are making. Um, let me add to the demand side, besides um, LPs, um, and voluntary commitments and disclosures for business um, and reputational reasons. Uh, increasingly, uh, Europe is driving us. Um, the U.S. in some ways is catching up. We're, we're remarkably faster than they are when we put our mind to it, actually. So the SEC's rule uh, was proposed much more rapidly than the European <laughs> efforts and even the U.K. effort. Um, and so we're going to end up, I think, leapfrogging, leapfrogging to some extent uh, in that area. But if the SEC did nothing, the UK is already mandating asset managers above some threshold to make uh, TCFD compliant reports uh, available. And since most of the bigger PE fund complexes have worldwide ambitions, uh, you know, that kind of leads to thinking internally about, all right, we need this anyway, so let's go ahead. So this is even putting aside the forward uh, thinking complexes like KKR, just anybody who hasn't been paying attention yet. All right, and then the EU, likewise, is going to be going even, has already gone even further and forcing asset managers to provide information to their end, in, end clients with a taxonomy of, of greenness, uh, which will then, do, is already affecting actual capital costs at the ground level for um, private companies. Um, so um, that's the backdrop. And now we come back to Christian's observations about where can the mandates help. I think in a world in which we're using necessarily noisy estimates to do um, uh, asset pricing um, on key metrics that basically we already have settled on, greenhouse gas protocol built 
you know, into the EPA rules, therefore part of the SEC proposal too, there you can really see the advantage of having a simple single approach that everybody is using the same thing. It may not be terribly fit for purpose for some companies that really don't have much of a carbon footprint. And so like I, I personally, if I were writing comment letters into the file on behalf of private companies, I might suggest you know, more tailored who, who exactly has to comply with this, maybe industry focus as opposed to just um, pure size focus. But at the end of the day, the value of some kind of comparable metric that can help discipline the qualitative reporting that also has to go on. So it's not just aspirational, all right? So actually show us something you can measure and track over time. I think that's a place where there's always been clear value. And even in the private company space, I heard yesterday from some of our, our, um, some of our guests um, that you know, they get and analyze uh, financial statements from private companies and provide valuations, and they're doing it mostly, although not exclusively, on the basis of GAAP, even though they're not legally required to do that. They do it, why? Because there's a common metric and a common approach, and that allows for a much greater um, bonding uh, in the form of information provision, lo lowering the cost of capital for them to do that. So I, again, just to reiterate, I think that's where the public uh, mandates can be the most useful. Can I just jump in? Uh, yeah, Tell me why just, I'm wrong. Uh, no, 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 you didn't. I, okay. like, I want to just make one point that um, yeah. this, is, this is not specific to ESG. This is more, again, back to the mandates. Is <clears throat> given that the private space is also becoming more and more intermediated, one of the things to think about is to what extent, you know, we've been talking about a, a, um, a reporting mandate for the private companies. The question is, is it actually that we need the reporting mandate for the private companies, or do we need to bring perhaps more transparency into the intermediation process and the intermediates, right? And so the question there in my mind is, because the, the, the PE funds or the, the sort of investors that have relatively large stakes will get the information. That's the point that John was making, is people can have su substantial stakes. They're going to ask for information. They're going to uh, obtain this information. So if we're really worried about sort of inf investor protection, we're worried about uh, you know, frauds and schemes in that space, then I think it's that intermediation process that we have to worry about. And the question is, should we maybe there uh, think about what uh, the rules need to be and whether there needs to be more transparency rather than uh, and that would also help with the trust, right? If, if John made this very important argument that I think in the end, if you want to have deep and liquid markets or you want to have a functioning capital market, trust is an important thing, and transparency typically will help with trust. So then that maybe needs to also focus on this intermediation process more so than necessarily forcing the private portfolio companies to provide this information publicly. Go ahead. I, let me just, let me, let me add one thing to that. Because, so may seem far afield from private companies, but it's connected. Index funds are eating the lunch of every other form of public company ownership and have been for 20 years, but really accelerating in the last 10, and it's not showing no sign of stopping. And the natural limit of that is actually every company can be private in the sense of it having you know, six index fund owners and 25 hedge fund owners, and you're way below any kind of ownership threshold, you don't need a listing at that point, really, except that's the only way you get into the index. And I actually think we're evolving rapidly towards a world where Christian's point is absolutely right. You're really just moving up dispersion. It's still dispersed ownership, right? Index funds are obviously collecting money from thousands and millions of people and then, then directly buying the company. So now we're going to have to think about what the index funds are expected to be reporting on in order to generate trust for them, and then they're going to transpose that down. The same thing is going on with LPs, right? I mean, pension funds obviously face enormous political pressure at times to report back to their publics. They then transmit that through to demands to the private companies that they invest in. And so I, I just want to echo Christian's point in building on those specific ways. If you think about each type of intermediated asset manager, who they have to deal with, the demands on them are going to increase as their role grows in capital formation. The last thing I'd say about all that is that's still going to leave space for private companies that are owned by you know, a founder. right? But they're not part of that world. It's going to leave space for founder and family office uh, private companies. It's going to leave space for private companies that you know, are partnerships of three people. Those are not really what we're talking about. What we're really talking about are different forms of dispersed economic exposure 
to what we call private companies, but really which, um, you know, 30 years ago would have been public. Elizabeth, did you, I, I saw you taking notes. I don't know if you had a reaction to what they had to say. Let me, yeah. let me step, step on one thing and I'll let you take it from there. Just to be very pointed in my question about KKR, and a lot of academics in this room here like to have cost of capital on the left-hand side as a variable and some sort of right-hand side variable to explain that cost of capital. Would your, in, in your argument as to why KKR is making these disclosures, because you feel pressures, like you talk about sustainalytics and people coming, you know, the shareholders coming to you, are you doing it because you think it's the right thing to do, or are you doing it because you can lower your cost of capital by making that disclosure? Um, <laughs> it, we are not doing it because we think it's the right thing to do. We're doing it because we believe it's important to stakeholders that are important to KKR. And that, like, that can be any, you know, our employees, portfolio, manage, um, portfolio company management teams, regulators, whatever the case is. So, you know, what I often say about um, ESG, and I, I hate the term, we started talking about that yesterday. Um, we all agree that that's we a all bad agree. term. Yeah, yes. we, all, it, we all agree. Um, you know, everybody likes it for different reasons, and I hesitate on the word likes it because a lot of people hate it too, but everybody who likes it can like it for a different reason, and it's either because they believe it's the right thing to do, they think it drives value, or they have to do it, right? It's sort of those are the three buckets, and they sort of have to speak to wherever anybody is on, on that spectrum. Um, so, but, but for us, it was not, it's never been because it's the right thing to do. It's because it's, it's about value, either value creation or value protection, which, which is um, really important as well. But I do want to comment on, on a couple of things and, and sort of talk a little bit about the asset owners and the LPs. And um, you mentioned the European regulation. So um, in case anybody is not familiar with the sustainable finance disclosure regulation that the EU um, developed, it went into effect March of 2021. Um, any asset manager who is marketing to European investors are subject to the disclosure expectations of the SFDR, um, not only in companies that we're investing in in Europe, but uh, any, any funds that are also marketed to Europeans that are investing in Asia or the Americas or whatever the case is. And so we, are, we have spent the last year plus trying to figure out how are we going to comply with the expectations of these regulations which will ultimately mean a lot of data c collection and reporting from our underlying companies. So US-based companies are gonna have to collect and report data to make sure that we're able to comply with the European Sustainable Finance Disclosure Regulation. So that's, that's another thing that's going on. Personal comment, <laughs> make sure you note that on this, is that the SFDR um, did exactly what I would recommend a <laughs> regulation not do, which is that it didn't align with any existing uh, frameworks out there. They created their own definitions of what sustainable investing is. They created this whole category of, of KPIs called principal adverse impacts, um, which are not aligned with any anybody, you know, how anybody else is thinking about it. They do introduce this concept of double materiality, uh, which is a whole nother issue. Um, and, and contrast that to the SEC proposal, where they're very closely aligned with the TCFD, Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosure Framework, as well as the greenhouse gas protocol, which are the voluntary frameworks that we've all been using for a very long time on, on climate disclosure. So I think, you know, the, the, I, I find that to be an interesting contrast, and we'll, we'll see um, how, how more quickly people are able to comply with something coming out of the SEC because they're well aligned with, with expectations and language out there. Um, but on the LPs, um, you know, back, I, back in 2010, we got one questionnaire from an LP asking us about our ESG processes. Um, last year, we got 170 standalone questionnaires. I think so far today, this year, we've probably gotten about 170. So it's, it's just the you know, ramping up very quickly. And these are multiple pages, right? Like 30 page questionnaires on how mm -hmm. is KKR thinking about ESG management and its investments. The, the other thing that we've seen over the years and is also ramping up is they don't want to just hear how are we doing it, what are our resources, what are our policies. By the way, they're all different, so we can't just like answer, you know, put out one, one report and answer the question. But they're now sending us very detailed templates uh, for each underlying portfolio company and asking for a range of KPIs for each underlying portfolio company. Um, the simplest of these 
is just climate focus, where they'll, they'll, ask, they'll list every single company they're invested in, hundreds of companies sometimes, and ask for scope one, two, and three emissions. Um, what's their five-year goal? What's their 10-year goal? What's their 15-year goal? How are they doing on those goals? The most complicated ones of those will have you know, 30 different ESG-related KPIs on that. Um, what didn't happen before, which is happening now, is we're being told this is a gating issue for them. Right? They will not invest in us unless we do X, Y, Z, unless we have a climate strategy, unless we're able to provide them greenhouse gas emissions, carbon intensity at the point of investment so they can decide whether to opt in or out. Um, so that is a, a real shift in the dialogue right now, and I think will have huge implications for every company, Asia, Europe, and Americas too. Can I ask a, a real quick, just simple factual question? And again, you can, you, 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 you promised you'll say no if you can't answer it. Um, <laughs> Uh, do you guys do any kind of assurance work on the, the reporting, either at the KKR level or at the portfolio company level? It's a, it is a great question, and it, you know, I, one of the things that I've been paying, well, I haven't gotten to that page yet in the SEC proposal, but is the... <laughs> I think it's 279. I'm only on page 191, um, is, is, is around the, the cost effectiveness. And I, my understanding, we were talking about this last night, is um, they, they have estimated the cost of like 500 or 400 something thousand dollars per year, um, which to me seems way high. Um, you know, the carbon emissions uh, calculations for KPR, 14 offices, I don't know how many people we have now, it's been changing daily, um, you know, is under $40,000 to measure our scope one and two emissions. No, don't quote me on that, that's, a, that's a, um, my, my memory. Assuring that data though, yeah was like $150,000, right? So um, we have decided not to do that this year because nobody's asking us to do that, but anticipate that that will happen, need to happen very soon in the future, certainly with, if the SEC proposal goes into effect as written, right? So um, not yet. Um, at the portfolio company level, data quality is a huge issue. Um, and I think we all need to, to figure that out together. I'm, I, I don't have an answer there. It, the, the assurance, that estimate is actually in line with what the SEC uh, was dropping on the assurance piece. And I, the reason I ask is I, I, I think of the things in the SEC proposal that's kind of going to move the frontier, it's that plus there is a financial footnote piece that says in your audited gap financials, Reg X is now, SX is going to is going to augment FASB and say you have to think about climate for every line item. And if there's a 1% variance associated with, and they have some you know, examples of how to think about it, then you have to drop a footnote on that. And then that's going to be part of the audit. That they only think is going to increase audit costs by 15 to 20,000, which to me seem low. Um, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe, maybe most companies won't trigger the 1%. Um, but anyway, those are two moving pieces. It's just a proposal. So if the reason I'm raising this is because I think private companies will, especially on these two elements, find themselves newly under pressure to think about those components. And so even though you're not public companies, or you're, you know, anybody connected to any private companies here, you know, you have an interest in the SEC rule as it applies to public companies. Because we're, even if my broader vision of why disclosure is important for private companies never comes to fruition, the channels that you heard um, Elizabeth talk about means that once the SEC rule is up and in place and used, it's going to become an important norm for LPs, et cetera, and to, to push private companies about. And it's also going to find its way, I suspect, into banking mandates because the Fed will eventually get around to um, forcing their banks to ask for information of a certain kind. They're already doing that to some extent, but this is going to end up, I think, becoming kind of the way to do it. And then, you know, insurance companies, PNC, et cetera, even if they're already collecting information for their own um, loss estimates, they're going to have to report to their regulators. And this is, again, going to become a kind of a standard in the same way. Uh, unfortunately, that you're also going to have to simultaneously live with the taxonomy in the EU, which means you're going to have kind of two two reporting regimes um, at least. Uh, having to coexist, at least two, uh, and maybe maybe more. Asia is still thinking, I think. Um, yeah, this banking channel, I think, is a very important channel to, to think about because you know, 
private companies get a lot of bank loans. And Europe is certainly using that banking channel as well to basically push um, the climate agenda through, the, through that channel. And that will become, um, <clears throat> I think, highly relevant. Let me um, cha change the, the topic just a little bit here. Christian, you started to allude to this a little bit earlier. Um, in, in last night's talk, and, and the SEC, several SEC commissioners have talked a little bit uh, about this over time as well, is I, I, I get the sense that there, there's a compulsion that we need more IPOs, that we need more, more of these firms public. And in some sense, part of what, what I hear in a little bit of what you've said and what, I, what I've heard from the SEC is that it feel, feels like to do this, we need to make the private markets more regulated in some sense instead of easing the regulations on the public side. I, first of all, I'm more than happy to be corrected if, if that view is not, not correct. Um, what, I, what I've always kind of wondered about is where's the problem statement um, with private market regulation in, in the sense that um, is there a sense that we need to protect investors that are in the private markets? Is it that I, I hear often that it's a shame that more um, uh, common investors don't have access to what's going on in the private markets when interestingly a lot of LPs are representing pensions and so forth. So they are participating, but as you mentioned, Christian, it's intermediated. Is that not a form of investor protection through that intermediation? I, I'm leaving this kind of as a big, kind of a not a very specific question, but maybe part of it is where do you feel the problem statement is? And I know, John, you've been in the SEC. Uh, maybe you have some insight as to where, where is my thought process kind of wrong there? And maybe my thought process is very jumbled here in asking this question. No, I, I, I think it's a fair question. I, I, to go back to investor protection, I, you know, people have very different intuitions about this. Um, I would say a fair chunk of people, especially in some combination of New York and Washington's lesson from 2008 was that our assumption that uh, institutional investors could protect themselves was wrong. They would predictably make major mistakes and that as a result, our background presumption for 30 years, which was as long as the capital raising was from qualified institutional buyers or whatever other threshold that's built into the various exemptions, it, like the SEC could just do a light touch and really not pay much attention to that world. And I think there are some people who came out of that thinking, nope, sorry, we can't trust the institutions anymore because 2008. You know, as time passes and 2008 starts to recede, and maybe that will diminish. But I do think there is a certain degree of, I think the current proposals um, from the SEC in the private fund space partly reflect that sense. And, you know, just to get into the micro a little bit on it, you know, there are proposals literally to change the terms of contracts between LPs and funds. I think 20 years ago, everybody said, why would we need to do that? And I think what I just said is partly why. The sense that um, the agents working for a large number of pension funds, insurance companies, mutual funds, whoever the other institutional investors in private funds are, have not always done the right thing for their beneficiaries, and therefore we need some regulation of that space. For my part, I tend to think that, you know, um, robust anti-fraud enforcement at that level would be enough. Um, there are some things occasionally that, not KKR, but other private equity fund complexes have done with their contracts that, you know, if you look at them pretty closely, it get pretty close to fraud. Um, and there have been a few enforcement cases in that space. I, for me, I think that might be enough for that goal. But now, just to finish my long answer, there is this other thing that I alluded to earlier, that the existence of a third, is what I heard yesterday, a fourth, or, you know, somewhere between a fourth and half of the entire economy in entities, which are not owned by one guy, but are owned by thousands of people intermediated through various organizations, with no disclosure, creates a certain sense of political skepticism about whether they're internalizing their costs, about whether they're doing the right thing. This is frankly part of the reason there's a little research cottage industry, some of you in the room have contributed to this, 
to show that private equity funds do a great job. Right? That part of the reason that research is in demand is to help diffuse the suspicion that actually what goes on when PE buys something is to hurt the, hurt the world. Right? Like this is why part of why Mitt Romney did not get elected, to be perfectly blunt. And so like that research, think about why is that research in demand? Right? If that research is in demand for just purely scholarship reasons, fine. I do. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about your answer, your question. It's in demand partly for political reasons, and they're in that space. That's why maybe the, the role for disclosure is a little greater than we might think, just from investor protection reasons alone. So anyway, it's, that's a long answer. Yeah. Investor protection, legitimacy is the other word I would throw in there. Mike, yep. Yeah, um, I don't have that much to add. I think John kind of hit the key points that I would add. I, maybe for the researchers in the room, I mean, we have spaces where we can actually study sort of much more disclosure light regimes, right? The OTC markets are a space where we can see that. And we do see a fair amount of fraud in, uh, in that space. So that, I think, highlights the, the role and relevance for investor protection. Um, but I do want to, since you mentioned the sort of studying on what the behavior is of uh, in, of private equity investors, and to bring it back to sustainability, one topic that I wanted to raise is sort of this issue of like um, mandates for carbon emission disclosures, right? And uh, and that brings us to sort of a, a, a topic where I think you might come out differently when it comes to private companies. So if you think about sort of why, when it comes to car say something like ESG and in particular carbon emissions, why would you think about a mandate? Mandate can do two things: they can inform investors. And they can drive change, like you know, broadly and uh, speaking. And for carbon emissions, which are textbook externalities, you could make the argument that a materiality-based system that um, this of disclosure regulation isn't going to really address these externalities because otherwise they wouldn't be externalities in the in the first place. Right? The social cost of carbon is different from the private cost. Now. It's an oversimplification because if there are carbon regimes on the horizon, these things long run can become very material. If your stakeholders have preferences um, and care about these things, then they can become material to, to the organization. But stick with the simplification for a moment, right? So if your idea now is you want to address to some extent the externalities because it doesn't seem like we can agree on what would likely be a first best solution, which is the carbon tax, then if you go down, John last night called it the fifth best solution, that we're going to is a disclosure solution, right? If you if that's sort of your 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 motive, then it's not clear why you would want to separate the private from the public companies because these externalities exist for both of these companies, and uh, or these types of companies. And so, if you go down that path, then you're really worried if you only do it for the public companies that you're going to get arbitrage and reallocation from the pu public to private. And that's been in the press quite a bit lately that sort of assets are being sold into the private space. And the, then the question becomes, and to me, this is a real research question that hasn't been answered, is you're worried about this public-private arbitrage if the assets get managed very differently in the private market. This is, again, where scrutiny or public information about these things would matter. But note that it's not obvious to me how, how this is going to cut. I think there's an intuition a lot of people have that, oh, once it goes to the private space, it's dark, and therefore it's going to be worse. But to the extent that there is a link that doing things in the ESG space that are connected to profits, and let's say um, there is a fair bit of work that would connect ESG with operating profits, this research is very difficult. And that's why I'm saying we haven't sorted this out, what that link really is. But imagine that the link was positive, that this is part of good stewardship of the assets and so on. Then all of a sudden, the private equity investors might have relatively strong incentives to actually internalize and care about these issues. And there is a couple of studies that recently have come out. There is a um, study out of Wharton, Bellon, and then there's the Shive and Foster, both of which suggest that uh, it's not clear that private companies would um, treat these assets or would, would uh, pollute more than uh, the, the public company. So to me, that's a super important research. Both the link to performance is super important because that would give us sort of, I think, a, a first hunch as to what's going to happen in the private space. And then secondly, sort of actually studying what's the environmental performance of sponsored, you know, sort of private 
uh, firms, the uh, independent private firms. For the independent private firms, the result with Shive and Foster is actually that they do better than the public companies. Can, can I, I want to follow that up with a, a quick question, Elizabeth. Do you, your reporting that KKR does on ESG generally, I know we hate the term, but um, whatever goes into that, is that on an annual cadence? Yeah. It is. And so I, one, let me link that to something Christian just said. You know, public companies in the US report quarterly and actually more often than that because of the 8K requirements and earnings calls and the like, they're almost in a kind of continuous reporting environment. Um, that's one extreme, right? You could have an annual reporting or you could have you know, every five year reporting as you settle up with your investors in a typical five year fund horizon. And so I, to build on Christian's point, I think you could have privately owned companies um, better managing the difficult trade-offs in how to, how to wrestle with the externalities that are rapidly becoming internalities over time because they're on a different reporting cadence, even with reporting, right? So you, again, I, I want to get away from like nothing or the full-on SEC regime. You could have um, voluntary reporting on an annual cadence is not inconsistent with having enough um, shelter from constant uh, analyst scrutiny on exactly what you're doing at any given point in time. And I think that's an advantage that the private company space will continue to have, even if we end up with some um, uh, public reporting there. Um, I, you know, it, that's, that's a classic reason that people say um, public companies want to go private. They want to be able to do some difficult things without current transparency, and then maybe they'll go public again. Um, well, okay, we don't maybe need to go public again, but still handle uh, these assets. That way. I'll just note Carlisle, who I mentioned in the outset, as part of the reason I mentioned them, their, one of their portfolio companies is one of the companies that have been in the headlines buying assets from Conoco and BP and the like, and, and yet they're, they're reporting, um, right? Now, maybe they're not doing quite as much reporting as a public company would have to do, and that's really the point I'm trying to make. Do you have any reaction to that, Elizabeth? Yeah, in my nightmare, you, you passed it to me after that, too. <laughs> 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 uh, <laughs> the, the answer is yes. No, I, I agree with all of that. Um, and in, in fact, we have plenty of evidence in our own portfolio, sort of similar to the example that you just mentioned, where um, you know, we're really leaning in. And in particular, I think private equity and KKR in particular, because we believe in it, has a really um, important role to play in the transition and doing that really hard work to transition these heavy emitters to a lower, lower carbon operating model. Um, one example uh, is our, a, a company, it's actually uh, called Contango. It's our only energy um, sort of asset in, in our portfolio. And since being getting involved is sort of a complicated um, merger and, and IPO process, but in, since our involvement, they created an ESG advisory committee it's now part of the board, and they created their first ESG report ever. So a lot of work went into that. Oh, sorry, and, and another, another point, they joined um, the, uh, what's it called, OGMP, the Oil and Gas Methane Partnership 2.0, where they're gonna be disclosing their methane and, and managing it over time. So a lot of things that we were able to bring to the table to get that company started on a journey that is gonna be really important for it in the next five, 10, 15, 20 years. So that's just one example of, of I think an important role that we play when we're involved and really engaged as active owners and, and helping them put these, these processes in place. So the answer is yes. Very good. Well, um, these are deep issues and we're right up against the nine o'clock time frame. But um, I really appreciate everybody's time here coming to, to participate in this uh, conference and thank you for, for being part of the panel. Thank you for having thank me. You. Now we have uh, John Barrios to present. On your uh, point about the private company data and mission statement, that would be useful mm -hmm. for I've been sort of uh, thinking about ways to sort of, um, I mean, you were sort of saying that these estimates that yes. True Cost and others are providing are relatively poor, uh, and having looked at some of the data, yeah. it's, ba it's basically revenue with a fixed uh, intensity. Yeah, yeah. Um, Oops, am I on mic? Okay, we're still on the mic, yeah. 
felt this before. How does this work? Why is this? Oh, he's, he's, is he playing around with it or? Did I just sit down and? All right, everyone, we are ready for our first paper today. So we're very fortunate to have John Barrios from Washington University of St. Louis and NBER. He's going to be presenting his paper on informing entrepreneurs. Uh, John, you have the floor. You have the next 45 minutes. Thank you so much. I'm, I was, my co-author was supposed to be doing this today. So uh, I'm glad for the invitation last minute to come in. And <laughs> um, So this is work with a, a couple of colleagues of mine at Stanford, Rice, and Boston College. And kind of picking off from the panel is thinking about kind of spillovers from public markets into private markets, right? So traditionally, a fundamental question, if you will, in kind of information economics accounting is to what extent does financial disclosure facilitate the allocation of capital with respect to investment opportunities, right? A lot of this focus has been on, like, how do you attract investors by providing more information? And that's kind of Mike's point of the lower cost of capital on the left-hand side and seeing what happens with respect to disclosure, right? So earlier research focuses along that type of vein. Uh, a more recent stream of literature uh, kind of examines more of a learning from public disclosure. So can public disclosures be used by other firms? Uh, there's both positives and negatives. So you kind of heard that yesterday with the proprietary costs, that information might kind of affect how your competitors behave with you. But there's also a learning where it can reduce uncertainty. Right? And that kind of arises from the fact that these investment opportunities that firms engage in usually come along with a lot of uncertainty. So in this paper, we're going to take a step back and think about the extensive margin. So does information from the public markets, from these public disclosures, provide an expanded information set for would-be entrepreneurs? So does information from the public market kind of spill over to facilitate the formation of new firms? Right? So in the face of uncertainty, we're kind of thinking of a nighty and entrepreneur. Right? In the face of uncertainty, does this information facilitate the decision to set up a firm? Right? So public disclosures can help entrepreneurs along various avenues. Right? So this is kind of a first paper. And we're just going to try to show you that, at least as a bundle, with respect to annual reports, quarterly reports, 8Ks, as well as supplemental information for other information intermediaries, expand the information set and reduce uncertainty, or at least perceived uncertainty on behalf of the entrepreneur. And we're simply going to see, do patterns in entrepreneurial activity shift with respect to variation in public disclosures by new public offerings, i.e. IP, around IPOs as our information set. And given that I was told there was like a five minute, I feel like I'm doing a TED talk, but nobody's laughing. Uh, <laughs> so in terms of previewing the findings before I open it up for questions and as I go more into detail in the paper, we're going to observe that around IPOs, we'll see a 7 to 10% increase in new business registrations. Moreover, we'll see an increase in search likelihood for on entrepreneurial activity. So we're going to look at Google searches and show that around IPOs, at least people are starting to start thinking about and searching for entrepreneurial, how to start your own business. Consistent with an information story, so we're going to try to focus on information rather than just kind of like an alternative growth, that IPO is just reflecting growth, we see a 30% increase in the amount of information being downloaded from public filings. We also observe, observe an increase in financial, in uh, entrepreneurial fan financing. So we see an increase of around 25% in SBA loans in these areas. Uh, well, yep. So we're, we're going we're gonna to tease that out, Steve. One second, let me, five minute TED talk, and then we'll get into all this. We're going to show you that the effect, when we look at establishment birth, we're going to show you the effect is stronger for similar industry establishments. We're going to look at business dynamism in terms of more active IPOs. So we're going to actually look at failed IPOs 
and show you that even around a failed IPO where information is released, you see an increase in new business registration. So it's not just the fact that the IPO occurred, is that new information is there. And the effect is gonna be concentrated in areas where you had higher economic uncertainty prior to the IPO, right? So when we look at two places that had an IPO, this effect is gonna be almost double in areas where there was a lot more uncertainty. And with that, we can open it up for, for questions. Ooh. So in terms of, I, oh, shit, you're throwing me off. All right. So let me give you a little summary first of what we mean by public information in the information environment. Right? We're not going to pinpoint one thing and say, well, it's one specific filing that's generating the new business. We think of this as an information bundle that comes along when firms go public. Right? So we know from mandatory disclosures from a lot of you in this room that supposedly 10Ks, 10Qs have information value to the market. Uh, this is a source of information on sales, industry information, capital structure, strategic directions, and provide valuable insights in terms to the firm's operations. Public firms also, as we know, pub voluntarily disclose information of the market, right? So we see these as value-relevant information. And along with this, because we're not able to separate this, information intermediaries like financial analysts, the business news, bundle this information and produce more information on top of this that gets released around the time of the IPO. So we're relying on the IPO to have a discrete event in which we can kind of say that the information environment changed. So when we think about new businesses, we want to make a distinction, right? So we think that the factors that drive entry into uh, entrepreneurship are going to be different for somebody that's going to start a business that employs individuals versus someone that's doing ad hoc self-employment. So we're going to focus more on incorporated business launches using a new data set that examines the kind of the cartography project, examines new business registrations at the state level for various years. Now, how are we going to measure this? As I alluded to a couple of slides ago, we're going to look at variation at the geographic level around information shocks from IPOs. Right? So in that sense, we're going to think about when a new public offering arises in that geographic area, those entrepreneurs that are more salient around the geographic area of the IPO are going to get access or perceive that information bundle. And the entrepreneurial activity we're going to measure, we're going to use two complementary data sets because as we kind of alluded in this conference, information on private firms is limited in the US. So this is mostly an extensive margin. So we're going to look at a novel data set that's almost full census of new business registrations at the state level. And that's available at the individual level. So we have business addresses in each of the states. We know when they apply for the business registration and we create a county level panel. However, there's a limitation here. So in the business registration data, we do not observe any industry indicators, right? So there's a couple of people that have played around with this data. You could try to do some industry based on names, but you could imagine how hard it would be to classify the industry for Amazon in a business registration. Is it a landscape company or is it a tech company? We don't really know from the name. So in order to kind of get at industry information, we're gonna go into the US Census data and we're gonna look at establishment births. There's a limitation there. These are establishments and not necessarily firms. So we're going to have measurement error in that. Secondly, in order to be in this, you, it, it's going to cat, you need to survive at least two years with employment. right? So we're trying to just check to see, does it spur kind of new business intent without thinking about kind of the efficiency or welfare effects in the post period, like competition? Are you overconfident now because of this new information? That's going to be, we're going to try to test that towards the end yeah, the I'll talk about it in one in a second, but yeah, the cartography project. So here's a distribution of new business registrations from 1988 to 2016, right? So these are more small business, right? You can see them more in middle America. This isn't just kind of California, uh, east and west coast. In terms of IPOs, we're going to use the geographic variation in IPOs since 1988 to 2016. And the whole point is we're going to use year fixed effects. So the bubble in one year will kind of be extracted out from that. Uh, but that's kind of where we're trying to get variation from. Again, we still see variation even within middle America. This is not just an east and a west coast kind of phenomenon. 
In terms of our outcome variable, back to Steve's point, the business comes from the startup cartography project that tells us something on the quantity and the quality of business starts. Their quality measure is kind of a predictive IPO, uh, IPO variable. Uh, and the data covers 50 states from 1988 to 2016. We lose a couple of states after 2014 in terms of reporting issues. From the census, we get, at the MSA level, we get establishment birth. Again, the main point of that is we can at least link it to industry to kind of tease out that it's not just some industri industry composition changes in the local area. I want to kind of remind people before now when I go to the IPO section is the literature on IPO, this kind of growth story, is very hard to document, right? A couple of papers have tried to kind of show geographic spillovers from IPOs, and that's very hard to document to the extent that you might even find negative effects when a firm goes IPO because they start kind of decentralizing their operations, so actually moving economic activity away from the headquarter as you go public, right? So keep that in mind, but we're still gonna kind of tease out that this is not just a growth story. The wealth effect, yeah, we, we're gonna tease that out as well. <laughs> All right, so our basic finding is post-IPO, we see an increase of, of new business re uh, registration, seven to 10%, so that's roughly between five to 12 new registrations in an area. In terms of, is something weird going on with respect to business registrations in the pre-period? There seems to be no systematic variation between the IPO counties and the non-IPO counties, and we start seeing a gradual increase around the IPO. This is, we get similar results if we replace the new business registrations with a measure of entrepreneurial interest from Google searches. So it's also people searching for how to set up your own businesses in that area relative to non-IPO areas. Yeah, but I'll show you, that, like, the wealth results should reflect then in employment and per capita income, right, of these spillover effects. You don't see that with IP, when you look at IPO, when you look at employment effects, you don't see that in the local geographic area. So that's the key. Yeah. Why, why do you expect the information effect of IPOs to be local? We don't, so we think there's measurement error. It's just gonna be more salient in order to tease it out more because we need some way to pinpoint access to the information that we think like local biases. Individuals that are in the local area are gonna be more saliently reflecting on the new information, but a lot of people in the control group in the paper you see as you expand, you can still see an effect size. So we're kind of relying on this local bias effect that at least entrepreneurs in the area are gonna be more salient to the information because they're just proximity to the IPO firm. But you could, you could almost make the opposite case, right? That before the company was public, the information was more localized. Mm -hmm. The moment it went public and it was on Edgar, then you know, everybody saw it. So that the information it. advantage, yeah. The, our, our point is that these new business uh, entrepreneurs aren't gonna, I agree with that, but I, well, like, the whole point we're gonna make is that these people weren't like sitting outside the firm or looking to see who the firm was investing and who was getting money from the firm or if Warren Buffett came out of the firm kind of stuff. These people were just in full employment. All of a sudden they hear that one of the local companies is going public. They've been considering do, setting up a business and now they're kind of exposed to more information with respect to business activity in the industry with the firm, and that kind of spurs them. But you can make an argument that somebody on the West Coast hears about the IPO on CNBC, and also is, we, that would be kind of the measurement error in terms of the attenuation and what we could actually find. They're all gonna be in our control group, basically. Counties that we're classifying as not shocked. Uh, yeah, just following up on this, I have exactly the same idea. I think if you use spatial identification, mm -hmm. I, really, I really think you have to tell a somewhat convincing story why the, Process, the acquisition or the processing of the information is actually really dependent on the spatial variation here. And I, I see the idea of the IPO headquarters. I was wondering also whether, let's say, the distribution of employees is the story. So where, 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 pe where people actually work. Yeah. And I think it, it would be super interesting and you, if you can really point this out, also to address some of the wealth issues maybe. So well, I'll, I'll, I'll show you the wealth, like the, the wealth issues I'll, I'll try to get at that, but it's not that, because the IPOs have not been associated with increases in economic activity in the local but I, environment. But I just 
because it's so easy to say, okay, here's the IPO headquarter, let's see whether something loads spatially. Mm -hmm. I think if you really want to convince people that this is information, you have to... It's not that easy because no paper has yet to kind of show that, right? Yeah. So, so I, I, like, so it's not that, I, I, I don't like these, like, blanket claims that it's easy when I, you get, like, there's a lot of researchers that have tried to show that. Yeah. And the paper, you know. But so, to your point on the spatial stuff, that is a limitation of trying to get, we, like, we don't have individual survey data from individuals and saying, hey, were you looking at the IPO prospectus? You know, this is. But don't worry, shut up. Yeah, yeah I'll, I, we can. And my colleague is taking notes, so I'm, I'm not <laughs> ignoring. So uh, maybe one reason why these effects may be local is that much of the information often informs about the local markets where they're working in. Mm -hmm. so, that may tie to the competition story because some of that entry may also kind of then take away yeah. something from them. And so that, that at least would be a reason why it's localized and that then ties in with lots of the literature. Well, the soft information and, and the hard information combination, yeah. Within the IPOs, mm -hmm. you can maybe top down and maybe somewhat atheoretical, nevertheless, um, can you know separate them into groups that have much more plausible information spillovers in a local, like a yes, restaurant. That's, I'm getting, getting there. I'm getting there. there. Right. Not atheoretically, but I'm but getting it, there. But, <laughs> but, it, but it responds to the prior point. Yeah. You're, okay, great. Yeah, this is, I don't even know why I show the main results anymore. I should just sort of. So, what is IPO capturing alternative explanations? Give me one sec, and then I'll get to you. So it could be just county growth opportunities, well shocks, right? So our next set of analysis is going to try to establish that we're not just picking up local growth. That's not explaining the IPO. And disclosure and information are prominent channels. This paper is not going to document the elasticity of information in new business formation, right? This is, I'm an empiricist, and I'm trying to be honest. That's always not a good case, but... We're just saying those other things are still at work. We're just saying that information seems to be a channel that's important. And why? Because I'm an accountant, so I have to fulfill my life that I'm not doing something that's worthless, so information must matter. Uh, with that question. This goes back to two of, some of the points previously made, so two questions. One, um, at the starting when you caveated that you don't have industry level, industry information. For the registration data. For the yeah. registration data. Um, I know in the cartography project in one of the papers, they, one of the ways that they say you're highly predictive of getting an IPO is that they link it to patenting or trademarking data. Have you thought of linking it, the micro data to that and then using maybe industry or you know, similarity in industry of IPO versus... Uh, versus the in, that's the innovation, like information exactly. and innovation angle. Yeah, uh, yes, that has been somewhat done already okay. by... Well, because you could see if you know, the IPO is in the same industry or same type of patenting class as a yeah, way to, to get use the patenting class for the sub yeah instead of the make -to that might, yeah that might be that that's a nice way to get a sample that we can at least it yeah. would be smaller but it would kind of get at it and then the second question uh, thing that came up was the question of whether you would expect it to really be local or sort of these broader you know information yeah. spillovers but the but that might be more relevant for later in your sample when you know, we have the 24-hour news cycle. We have really easy access to SEC filing downloads. So maybe so you we, could... over time, that's something that I don't have in the... But, like, if you think of that, not... There's heterogeneity in this treatment because information becomes now more accessible. Exactly. So, actually, IPOs after the 2000s don't give you that big of a bang because that information is more salient, right? Exactly. And then, secondly, we're going to then use that. So when we go into, like, Edgar and search activity we're really working in the second half of the sample, right? Because right. Edgar doesn't start into, until 2004, uh, 95 or so. Thank you. All right, so in terms of trying to get away from the local activity, we're gonna kind of do a, an instrument where we're gonna use the, the market returns that facilitate IPOs, and then use that kind of that predictive to kind of look at variation that was driven in IPO because overall market condition was better. When you kind of separate that and you look at that, we still observe that these IPOs that should be driven by just general market, like the market is good to go public, is still driving new business registrations in these areas. Da, da, da. When we start looking at like spin-offs versus private to public, uh, 
we kind of start seeing that you see larger effects when it's an actual private firm that goes public versus a subsidiary that kind of gets spinned off. The wealth effect disappeared. That slide should not be hidden. We look at the, fa the wealth effect is we looked at the at failed IPOs. That should have been the, in there. <laughs> and we look at the effect is actually the similar size and slightly larger in failed IPOs. So there is, you don't get the wealth effect from individuals actually benefiting from the IPO. So yet we do observe where the information was released, we see new business registrations in these counties relative to the non-IPO counties. When we look at kind of economic activity or in the county using traditional measures of economic activity, wage growth, employment growth, we really don't see much in the post-IPO period. And that is like, I'm not aware of any paper that has found any significant effect unless you start conditioning on the size of the IPO and interacting, and even in that case, it's negative. And I think that's Corniaga and colleagues at Penn, at Penn State. Right, so at least local employment wages aren't changing, nor employment in the short run around the IPO. Now let's try to focus on the information channel, and I'm just gonna kind of give you, try to look at cross-sectional variation that should be more relevant for an information story rather than an economic growth story. So given, given that you're showing that there is some entry, but then on average there's nothing going on in terms of the, in the growth, et cetera, are you also, is that playing That's where we're going to get into, into the wealth. Into the story that it's just a redistribution primarily? Potentially, or, or the other thing is the timing between registration and actually setting up a full is not, it's probably longer than three years to actually see meaningful variation in federal statistics with respect to employment and growth. So that's, that's an alternative story. Again, this paper was more to kind of set up, we wanted a power to pick up people's entrepreneurial interest. Now we need to kind of start thinking about, are they, should they have been entrepreneurs? Are they might potentially be positively biased and such? That's, we're gonna get, try to tease it out. We're not gonna be doing such a good job given the data, but that's future work oper research opportunities. So I'm wondering, did you have a chance to include um, in the failed IPOs, like Jobs Act, confidential filing failed IPOs? No, we haven't done that partition. Like I'm just wondering if you had a like if you had a sufficient number of them, which maybe you wouldn't, it would be kind of an interesting I think, falsification because they don't should yeah. have any information either. Okay. Yeah, yeah. John, uh, you, you you keep mentioning entrepreneurial interest. Is there an element of learning that you're interested in? So, for example, what and could you get at it through the dependent variable, by which I mean that the percentage of new business registrations that are still surviving in five years' time. That's our final test to try to get at the learning angle. The problem is there's a lot of measurement er error there because we get establishment deaths, but I don't know when that establishment was set up. And in the business registration data, we, we have delistings or dere we don't have that many deregistrations. You can't link the deaths to the births? Not in the establishment data that I currently have. We're using public data, so this is not, we're not using any of like the private census data, this is all public data. But yeah, that was our point. So to think about information, we're gonna partition counties based on economic uncertainty. Ideally, we would use kind of variation in economic profits. We've had kind of those survey measures but what we ended up using here was variation in wage growth, thinking about, well, if there's a lot of volatility in wage growth in the area, there's a lot of uncertainty about economic activity in the area. And then we're gonna see that the post-IPO really kind of loads up in these areas where there was a lot of volatility or where we're claiming is economic uncertainty, where information should matter more. We're then gonna look at disclosure consumption do we actually see something going on with the actual disclosures? Again, this paper is not to say that this is all coming <laughs> from one specific 10K being downloaded, but again, this would be consistent with an information story. So we're gonna look at disclosures around IPOs and we're gonna see that yes, in these IPO counties, right? And we can also expand it to neighboring counties that have a similar effect because right now we have them in the control. Back to the point about spatial variation, where is the actual natural drop off we see that we see a large number of downloads in the post period. Again, S1 filings seem to be largely downloaded as well as 10Ks of firms in these industries. This is updated. 
Now, when we look at what exactly happens with the business registration, we see in these areas where you have a lot of high S1 filings, that's where you're kind of seeing a load in the new business registrations. And then we try to get at, after the IPO, it's really the areas where you have a lot of these downloads that are associated with more business registrations. So I, we're not saying that that's specifically coming from the S1, but that's proxying that these are areas where there's more search going on for information, i.e. a reduction in the uncertainty. Hand was up somewhere. So thinking a bit more about the information story, I realize you guys have issues measuring industry for these startups, is that right? Do you know anything about what yeah. products they offer? We only have the registration data. We only see the name of the agent, we see their address, we see what year they set up, and that's about it. And you can't infer anything from the name of the firm about what, like if it's Bob's construction company, clearly it's, is there a way? You can do for that, but like, what, again, oh, Amazon. Okay. What would you clar clarify Amazon would be? Is it yeah. landscape or is it tech? I think the patent data is nice to kind of getting a subsample of at least tech firms or some innovation firms that we can kind of play around with. But again, these are just different lates, yeah. right? Now, we, as we start partitioning the sample, like we're just getting different compliers along these, these measures. But yeah, that we, we tried the industry stuff. I think Joey Engelberg on the partisanship paper, he's tried doing some uh, industry stuff. You can leave it up to the reviewers of how believable that industry idea is. But uh, again, so again, S1 seemed to be loading consistent with some information story. When we look at entrepreneurial financing to make sure that kind of is this translating. So now we're kind of moving into like, yeah, you registered a business, but are you actually setting something up? Again, these areas, you see higher SBA loans. The values of these loans are higher. We also see more VC funding in these areas. And we also see the value of the funding go up in these areas relative to the non-IPO areas in the post period. Right? Um, entrepreneur so this is kind of our trying to get at efficiency. Well, we're going to say, hey, first we're going to show you in these areas where you have higher Edgar downloading, do we actually see more better outcomes or winning outcomes for new business starts? Areas where you have more downloading, you're gonna see more IPOs, more likelihood for these small businesses to be acquired, as well as both of them, right? So either acquired or IPO. When we look at now trying to get at, are these post-IPO establishments better or worse? One way we can, so step back, to the point that I was making, we can't trace when that establishment was actually founded. We, do, we can't trace from birth to death. What we tried to do was, let's do a mapping between the relationship between establishment birth and death in these counties over time. And then what I wanna see is, after the IPO, do we start seeing deviations in this kind of natural death rate? And what we end up seeing that in the post IPO, you kind of start seeing that in these areas where you had a lot of establishment birth before, you start seeing less likely, more likely to have death. So that's consistent with like maybe you're overstarting. In the natural, just in the, in the IPO firms, again, where you just see the actual counties, these counties tend to have less death over time, right? So these establishments aren't dying over time. However, if we start thinking about the economic activity in the pre-period about funding, it's not really coming from these areas that we're already setting up new establishments. So that's kind of saying we could probably think we're picking up more of these entrepreneurs that were bi positively biased. I wouldn't sell that too much given the data limitations, but it was our way of trying to get at the welfare effects of the efficiency of this stuff with the information being interpreted. So a drum that might be a stupid idea, but if I recall- I have those every day. <laughs> <laughs> See, two of us. So um, I, I recall this literature saying that Edgar downloads also cluster around business schools. So would it, would it be maybe an interesting channel just to look at that when you have business schools located close to you know, an IPO place that you actually see more reactions via this business school and then maybe even you can look at some of the incubators of these business schools or startup activities that they run. So whether, whether there is sort of a mechanism that even, even goes through teaching? Just, just an idea, so. Yeah, that, I, 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 I like it. Uh, my <laughs> co-author, Yael, she does a lot of stuff with uh, incubators and how that facilitates and like learning through those things. I'm, I'm trying to kind of 
cost and benefit of like a book on information and versus an academic article and trying to not like that's I'm trying to but I agree that's something that we would kind of want to tease out more. I need to get more familiar with the incubator literature and the I have another co-author that does the downloads. I'm I wasn't aware of the fact of the downloads being concentrated at business schools. Apparently business schools don't invest in Bloomberg then because you should be using a Bloomberg. <laughs> um, I think I'm almost done. I'm I, Quick question. Do you talk about magnitudes here, or how do we think about? Well, I did, but I skipped over it. Like two to three registrations in the establishment the birth. It's, so the magnitude isn't that huge, right? So that's, that was comforting, at least for me, given that we weren't capturing something crazy. Well, I guess the um, question I was thinking about is this discussion that Steve and John had in yesterday's panel. Um, about the business dynamism mm -hmm. and whether it's increasing or decreasing and, and that kind of thing. Um, with the decline in IPOs, you know, since the late 90s, um, do you speak to any of that kind of discussion or how to, how to think about that in terms of, it, it, if part of your premise is IPOs begat more firms, which should begat more IPOs and so forth, this kind of positive. Potent, not necessarily, like we're very short term, like, this is a very simple late, right? This is like a late of entrepreneurs that are deciding to jump in, given what our story is, information from the IPO, to extrapolate that out to like general macro trends and business dynamism requires a couple more assumptions about what exactly, who we're capturing and how does that translate? Kind of getting to Matias's point about competition and we're, we're trying to be, we, we don't want to get too much into that right now because we don't, I don't think the data that we have can get us into the dynamism stuff per se right now. This is more of like information seems to matter. We need to be kind of expending more resources to kind of think about this interaction, maybe private census data and interacting that with some variations of disclosure or public firm disclosure might get us there where you can actually track the, these establishments and their deaths and see if we could do something with that. But we, I'm, I'm conservative, I'm, I might be blissful with jokes, but I'm trying to be conservative with economic implications given the data restrictions. All we can say is that it just seems that around the information exposure of the IPO, we have new entrepreneurial interest going up and we actually see the registration of new businesses and we try to show you that that's not being linked up to any like wealth economic activity that the IPO might be reflecting. Business dynamism, yeah, if you're willing to kind of take some more assumptions and push that further, Go for it, but I, I'm a little uh, more conservative on pushing the business dynamism. I'm just trying to be honest here. So to come back to something within your data um, mm -hmm. that you could maybe, I think, maybe do. So I, as I think when you say information from the IPO, there's, there's one vision, which is just there's the fact of the IPO, and it's inspiring, and my, this guy across town just got rich. And then, but then you've got the Edgar downloads, which suggests actually a very different idea, which is actually there's real content to the document that they read, which then yeah. they use. Okay. That was like when I started, we said there's a bundle of yeah. stuff that could be and going so on. How do you tease this apart? I, one idea would be to look at the, for the heterogeneity within the IPO firms. Some of them, I think, are going to be much more plausibly providing information useful to local entrepreneurs, like a restaurant company mm -hmm. or a uh, construction company. And then others are less so. They're going to be running business models that you know are on the internet, biotech. or yeah. biotech or yep. whatever. And so it just looked so anyway. So one test that we do have is when, we, at least with the establishment where we have the NICs, we can see IPOs in a similar industry versus similar, not, and you right. you clearly see that if it's in the non-same industry, you see it's a very small effect. There's still something there, but that could just yeah. be, hey, IPO, I can set up something. So, but think about coding words within the IPO prospectuses. So oh. they're going to be references to the locations. They're going to be references to uh, um, establishments. Uh, you get it. So, um, like, create kind of like an index of the informativeness of the IPO. Okay, I, hopefully someone's done that. But, but yeah, I will. <laughs> <laughs> Along the lines of um, restaurants, maybe uh, providing more useful information in their locals. Uh, so, I think two two cuts that you could look at if you haven't done so yet mm -hmm. is on. Uh, which types of companies are actually IPOing? So, what's their size, and what's their industry in, ter in terms of is it <laughs> um, is it a tradable versus a non-tradable um, sector, for example? 
it's if it's non tradable, then it's like the restaurants they they are yeah like input things. versus then consumer you have fit yeah local information that you're gaining for that, uh, and so most of the papers would suggest that then this is quite localized, and same with the small versus large, you get a bit um, as Christian hinted at I yeah. think in the paper later. I'll talk about this a bit, but then you you can talk about whether this is more this redistribution or it's actually the large firm just gives kind of free externalities to others versus it's now just others trying to take something away from a, from a smaller yeah. IPO. Yeah, I, th I think part of that kind of the reason of looking at the registration is that you didn't have this kind of strategic interaction on the part of, because you're just setting up to register the business, right? That's why kind of going back to Mike's point about what does this mean for dynamism, I'm, I'm trying to not get into this strategic interaction yet, which it should be studied, and that's kind of the natural question to then kind of go for. But given the data that we currently have for this, it's kind of saying, well, these are just like John Do decides to register the business, and then eventually you could see it through the establishment that they're at least employing people, but it doesn't kind of tell us about, well, now are we redistributing between the dominant firm, the, the public firm, and the private firm. Um, I think, again, I'm trying to push that there should be a larger literature on this interaction between information and you know these smaller private firms. I don't have to sell that in this audience, but like that's kind of like there's a lot of work to be done. And as we get access and potentially generate more data about these private firms, we can then start thinking more along the lines of the strategic interactions in the U.S. setting. We you know we've we've done kind of the IPO test. Back to your point about. And back to kind of Steve on the bubble of being like, yeah, when you have these like IPO waves, the information value there is not as big because once you have three firms, so we had another test where you can look at at least for the counties where you have multiple IPOs, what happens is the, within a three year period, you have another IPO in the same industry or a different industry. And you don't really observe anything much when that IPO comes in that same industry because that information's already been saturated by the first public offering. Uh, and we've done, cross-sectional test along the industry based on kind of public firm presence, another measure that's common in the accounting literature, and you'll see a similar story there. Industries where you have more public firms, i.e. more information spilling over to the private sector, you actually see more business generation of new startups in the establishment data. Again, that's just cross-sectional. We can't really tease out that it's the information per se. But again, I hope to kind of start setting out an understanding for the role of information kind of like in the panel, in the public markets, and what does that mean in the private market, and kind of these strategic interactions between these two markets as we kind of start seeing that they're more intertwined than we would like to believe. And hopefully, this adds to this literature on the role of financial disclosure in the real economy, and I look forward to seeing a lot more work, hopefully, on this. And I'm going to end early. This is a new one for me. I tend to, like... Any other questions? Class dismissed. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so we have until 10.15. Thank you. Still on? I'm still on. I was, I was going to go to the restroom.
Is everyone entitled to access to private equity? Like, well, what? I mean, I don't think private equity access to the act to the common man and private equity is going to solve any. It's not going to be the first one. I guess I'd probably have to be a qualified investor, right? To be able to do things for private equity. I guess it depends on what you need to do. Someone in my neighborhood is starting a 
you know the oh. So why don't we get seated, everyone, and begin the next session. Uh, we're very lucky to have Matthias Breuer present, uh, uh, work with his co-authors on reporting regulation and corporate innovation. As with the previous sessions, Matthias is going to take about five minutes to uh, tell us what he's doing, and then he'll open up for questions. And if you have a question, please make sure to turn your mic on. It's all yours. Loosely. Um, so I hope this, uh, you, you'll see how this, this uh, paper fits in. I uh, found like the, the call to arms and uh, by the commissioner yesterday and uh, today's uh, earlier uh, panel uh, quite relevant here and I hope we can uh, tie several of those ideas that we've seen also of, of John's papers and other uh, pieces uh, together in this uh, paper which is as Andrew said, co-authored with uh, Christian Lloyds and Stephen von Haverbaker. Um, and broadly, this paper is motivated by the observation that reporting requirements are quite uh, ubiquitous. Uh, if you look around, as we've heard this morning, uh, the SEC requires publicly listed companies to publish audited financial statements um, in the interest of um, investor protection, but also the public. The EU actually takes this then a bit more literal with protecting the public because they are saying um, we want to protect all the stakeholders and so even if you're not a publicly listed company, you may have to disclose. And this is uh, the setting that this paper will be mostly in where even private firms are going to be required to report. Uh, the nice thing now is exactly that the SEC seems to be thinking at least about whether we may need some more transparency in this private market also in the US. And so we, we hope that, uh, of course, with all the caveats of generalizability, et cetera, that uh, the European setting and our paper can speak a bit uh, to that point. Now, while everything is always um, put in place to protect investors and the public, if you ask the question to, to companies how they like these mandates, they typically, as Jerry pointed out yesterday in the Q&A, well, they tell you, well, we don't like it so much because we have these proprietary or competitive cost concerns. Um, but from the point of view of the regulator, it's not immediately clear whether you would want to consider those uh, seriously because one, companies can simply say it's proprietary cost concerns and they're saying it for agency issues or the like. Or, it, one firm's proprietary cost may actually be another firm's benefit. And so as long as we're in a somewhat closed economy there um, and everything is, uh, is happening locally, then on that, nothing much may be going on. So in this paper then, ultimately, uh, one of the questions that we're going after is what happens to companies' innovation incentives, and in particular at the aggregate level, precisely because we may want to start caring about companies' proprietary costs if they're indeed inhibiting uh, innovation, because as Ufuk in the very first panel was pointing out, well, this tends to be a key driver of growth. So innovation incentives of firms, in particular in the aggregate then, uh, will be uh, very important to understand whether these proprietary cost concerns are real and should be taken seriously by, um, by regulators. So that's the basic research question. Does regulation uh, mandating the disclosure of financial statements affect corporate innovation? Um, why innovation? Well, not because the financial statements that we look at will be detailed descriptions of products and thus they are immediately related to companies' uh, patentable innovation, but because they are closely related to private or proprietary information, maybe on, for example, the returns of, um, of certain uh, innovative activities such as finding new markets and the like. And because innovation is as I just said, and as Ufuk made uh, as a more credible point than me saying that, uh, is a key driver 
uh, behind uh, long-run economic growth, and that really for us as, as, a, um, as empiricists then gives us a nice first outcome that we can use to at least speak to something that may be uh, quite relevant um, for the higher level concepts of uh, growth, welfare, and the like. Okay, so the ultimate motivating question then obviously is, uh, do we lose innovative activity or even gain it as a result of these uh, reporting requirements given these proprietary cost concerns? And that is a hard question to answer uh, because there may be all these uh, spillovers as um, John Barriers was showing earlier because uh, yes, some firms may lose, but there's also the spillovers to competitors, to uh, suppliers, customers, and the like. So uh, that really makes it a, a hard question to empirically study. Um, and we try to make some progress. So this uh, will not solve the, and settle the issue, but we, I think, uh, try to make a useful progress here by making two steps. First, we're using uh, an aggregate approach. And why is that useful? Well, um, if you just look at the firm level and compare a treated firm with a control firm, and there are these spillovers, then you may see that the treated loses out, the control gains, so you see a big difference in difference coefficient. But on net, nothing is going on, or in net, things may even be good, uh, even better if the spillovers are dominating. So just looking at the firm level, as much of uh, the, the prior literature, if anything has done, wouldn't help us here. So our uh, first modest step there is to take it up to at least the industry level, and then uh, incorporating several of those spillovers there and hoping that that gets us closer to a net effect. Clearly, this is not gonna be perfect. There will be spillovers across industries, across countries, and the like, uh, but that is our first uh, modest um, pro progress here. And the second big part, which um, also will come in uh, nicely um, with the, this theme of, of the conference where it was about data and measurement, is how do we measure innovation, actually? Ufuk um, also briefly talked about it, that patents are one way, but by far not, not a perfect way. And so uh, what we want to do is get innovation measures that are not directly coming from the financial reports. Why is that important? Well, otherwise we may just force firms to talk more about the innovation, and then we're summing that all up, and it looks like there's more innovation just because they're talking more about it, not because actually there is more innovation. And then patents themselves, while a useful measure in, in several respects, of course, patents are not just a measure of how much innovation is out there, but how are companies protecting their innovation? And so this protection is actually one which is closely related to disclosure because you, it comes with patent disclosures. And so in our case, uh, it is something that also doesn't, uh, doesn't really qualify as the best outcome for us. We still look at patents to, to understand how they move, uh, but you, we'll, we'll have, I think, something, something interesting uh, to say about that too. So what we're then actually doing is we use the Community in Innovation Survey in Europe. This is in essence census level data, uh, meaning this is Eurostat, um, collaborating with national research institutes and national statistical offices to send out innovation surveys which they've been harmonizing over decades and putting together to measure comprehensively um, the innovation activity in particular uh, to get at measures that are useful at the aggregate, but are actually measured at the firm level. And we started out with this project actually just having the aggregate, and then in the spirit of the first part of, of yesterday's uh, talks, well, then, then you notice there may be lots of uh, heterogeneity underlying this that you're, you're losing, and so we now have the firm level access to this, to, uh, where we always have to go to Luxembourg to, to really look at that. Uh, but that will give some richness of what's happening at the aggregate, and we'll actually uh, show a bit more of that uh, later. Um, with that said, let me uh, briefly run through the results, and then I'll uh, get to Nemitz. Okay, just so we're all on the same uh, page, what we're finding is the proprietary cost effect indeed comes through, meaning the disclosure requirements uh, tend to reduce companies' um, disclosure incentives, uh, in particular as a mechanism that we're identifying there is the dissipation of returns to innovation. So if exposed, you're always having to disclose that you found a profitable market. People can come in, as John Barrios was showing with the entry, take some of the rents away. So ex ante, you have less incentives to do this. 
This is at the firm level. Um, at the aggregate level, the effect uh, is conceptually and also with us empirically relatively ambiguous because at the industry level, yes, we're finding fewer innovating firms, but we're not finding that innovation spending in total is necessarily going down. And so that leaves us with, with at the industry and especially at the economy-wide level, this effect is uh, still quite unclear, in particular also because we have a big caveat here that we can measure well how many firms are, are innovating and how much they're spending, but the value of the innovation is very hard to measure, and so we'll have to be very careful here. But along the way, we find exactly these strong distributional effects because you see fewer innovating firms but not le less spending. Why that? Well, we see a relocation from many smaller firms towards a few larger firms, and uh, that t contributes to this concentration of innovating firms among uh, larger firms, which if you've listened to Ufuk before, like the size distribution matters actually quite a bit for innovation, and so we, we may be losing uh, some of the more radical innovation uh, down on the smaller companies, uh, but that's something where we don't have too much to say about, but there's a rich literature on that that especially Ufuk and others have been working on. But with that said, uh, Nemit. So, so just, just to understand, the premise of the paper is, is that disclosure uh, discourages innovation incentives because it facilitates others, it allows others to mimic the ideas, right? That's, that's the idea. Yes, so it, it in essence uh, mimics or it, it dissipates the ex-post rents. What does that mean? That means it can be through competitors seeing that there is a profitable local market and you're entering there too. And that's actually in my job market paper, I find lots of that entry that uh, John was, uh, was showing, I think, at, in, at least in the European sense, was subsidiary entries of larger companies going in there and trying to take it away from smaller ones. Then similarly, you can have exactly this dissipation of economic rents through if you have a large supplier or a large customer and they see that you're pretty profitable and they see other places where they could get things cheaper because now they're seeing a lot of potential um, customers or producers, and so then they can uh, can bargain better with you, and so again you're losing export rents. And so I think while generally it's not so clear how, for example, competition and innovation are related, what is pretty clear is if exposed you're taking rents away, ex ante you have less incentives to innovate. That's why this first level result here should not be super um, super surprising, but it's useful to establish that once. And then the key is to understand what actually happens on the, at the aggregate and he, who may be gaining or losing here. The, the reason I ask this is because uh, you know, the, the, survey, the survey approach to measure innovation is, is very interesting. But uh, so just looking at the survey, and, and if, if I'm understanding this correctly, the survey defines an innovation as an innovation need only be new or significantly improved through your enterprise. It could yes. have originally been developed or used by another enterprise or organization. So it, it, it falls, at least in my mind, it, it seems like innovation can be defined as imitating other companies, which, yes. which is not how I think of innovation. Yes. So, but then, but this is exactly, so the, the survey is designed by innovation researchers. So they, they view it quite broadly. And in particular, because for example, for this motivation of why we care about innovation, we don't care about it because we want to learn about unicorns and these ones, but because innovation and its dissipation, meaning adoption by uh, lots of the firms that are operating in the economy, that is key to having productivity improvements and uh, thus kind of the, the growth that we're seeing. It's not just that one firm uh, gets a bit more productive and no one else. So that's why even uh, getting products that other ones have been using in other regions already, if you're introducing them in your region and that's new to you, this is going to be useful innovation that the, the innovation researchers care a lot about and that from the economic perspective that we're taking here, why we're looking at innovation as a kind of Schumpeterian um, exercise of materializing and, and getting more uh, economic benefits for, for the company through uh, improvements, whether completing new products or uh, adopting other processes, uh, that, that comes through there. And that's why we're actually pretty happy about this alignment because the, the broadest sense is exactly what you would want to have um, and how, for example, the, the ones who, who uh, designed the survey were very particular in saying, look, this aligns pretty well with, um, but if, with if the, it. But if, if that's the case, then say you're a company you, and you come up with a new innovation, now you're required to provide disclosures. I, I imitate what you do, 
uh, based on your disclosure. Yes. Uh, but then based on this survey, I would say that I'm an innovator, right? My innovation is increasing because I'm yes. copying you. So it's, it, it, Yes, like and, and that, like that we would be fine with, but we're not. We're finding that fewer firms saying they're they're actually innovating, although that it could just be the, uh, the mimic thing, and that's exactly why this discouragement is coming through there. And so, yes, you could have that now. Lots of firms are saying we're innovating because they're in essence mimicking that. But as long as it's not hurting the incentives of anyone else, that's fine. But we're finding that it tends to hurt the incentives of some, uh, and actually to to do the original innovation or the, the adoption there to begin with. So on net, it doesn't look like that there's more firms innovating, although the hurdle, as you're saying exactly, is not super high here. If anything, it's going down. And that's that's why, if anything, this, this kind of concern would work against finding what we're having here. And that's precisely why we're, we think, I think, uh, or why I think also that, that measurement is uh, pretty neat here. Because one, for economic theory, we would like it to be also the adoption, and two, if anything, that would suggest that we would not find that fewer firms are saying we're innovating here. If you're just thinking, okay, this disseminates the information and so more people can simply do the same, but it's not harming anyone's incentives to, to do the innovation to begin with. What's the time period? Uh, this is uh, the 2000 to 2015. Okay, so I just read a comment on this paper as well as John's. Um, increasingly, all this data is available from scraping. And this is where pitch book, you know, pitch look at what pitch book does now versus what they did seven years ago. You can now, and it, you can go online. You can find out who got venture funding. You can find out what they're doing without any regulation. All this data is available, and seems like it's already there. And yes. then if you ask the VC, there's a, a very nice book by Sebastian Malaby called The Power Law about what VCs do. And Sequoia was very early in scraping, figuring out who's scaling and yeah. investing in them. That's how they found WhatsApp and some others. And now, every, not everyone, but a ton of people are doing it. So this this thing about disclosure reducing firms' innovation centers, it's it's out there. There's nothing I, you can't I, find. I shouldn't say nothing. It is, there's very little you can find. So the yes. addition of, if you, if you think regulation you know, you're finding, you're, you're actually not arguing for more regulation, yes, but, exactly. which is good. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> the, the, I still got the, my the PhD fact, here, so no the, worries. The, 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 the fact is, I would just say it's irrelevant now. Yeah, I, I, love, I love the point in so far as while this, <laughs> while this is Europe and it's about the disclosure regulation, I think a very similar pattern is going on exactly in the U.S., uh, but this is now like stretching it a lot, but this links back to the uh, dynamism point, the increase in concentration and the like uh, that was discussed in the first panel. And so far as what we're showing here is that information helps the largest firms to better take out their potential competitors to keep them small and have some concentration at the, at the national markets and thus kind of keep out uh, that type of competition. That stuff is exactly what you're seeing in the US, precisely because here now we're sitting here and are enjoying new data, but that's what the, the private firms themselves were using uh, all the way along. And so Laura Feldkamp makes this argument about data and, and how this kind of scales with uh, company size. And so this is exactly the thing why, why I think while this is happening in Europe with this regulation, a similar thing without regulation just becoming more available data due to scraping, etc is most likely happening in the US. But again, here now I'm pushing it a lot, but just in the, uh, to, to try to make the connection to the earlier uh, panel we had um, on uh, uh, yesterday. Uh, Jin Wen. So yeah, one, I was wondering if you can like help me think about the the link between like financial reporting and, and competitor innovative like decisions. Where again, like I think your target audience is is competitors consuming like a, you know a focal firms financial reporting. Innovation decision seems like a very like a specific decision, whereas financial reports are more of a general sense of how the business is doing. Yes. I just wanted to think yes. of, get more sense of like how you're thinking about 
no, this excellent. link and, and so yes, on. Yes, that, that's why I said when, when, I, when I had this why innovation on there, not because financial reporting is the first order thing that you would go to if you want to replicate a product of a company, but as long as it informs about the economic returns of what companies are doing, this is valuable information, and that's why we're seeing this entry and this, this type of then spurring further search, for example, into what are these companies actually doing and the like. I think that's the, the main channel that's going on. Uh, let me give you a bit more context here why, in, in particular, I think that makes a lot of sense here uh, with the size distribution, and that's where it comes in to know uh, multiple firms and, and what size they are. This effect is concentrated for the smallest ones exactly because these are the ones that wouldn't voluntarily disclose, and so they, they are not known by the large companies. But if they're forced to disclose, the large companies, which would otherwise have a hard time to figure out the profitability in all these little markets, because that's too costly for them, now they can see all the markets and go into conditionally on seeing the information into the few profitable ones. That takes profits away from the, the firms that are in there, and that is kind of pretty straightforward then to map from reduced exposed returns towards less innovation. But this is exactly just happening for these smaller ones. It's not that uh, the large firms, Apple discloses, and now a small firm can come in and take rents away, and that's why Apple can't innovate anymore. So that completely, um, if, if, you, if you're thinking that that would be something we're telling, definitely <laughs> we can't make that story, and I don't think this would be going on. But um, now from, from all the data we have on who's actually also incurring these costs, it's going to be exactly uh, this type of idea of the small, many niche markets, which otherwise you wouldn't know much about, you can now more easily exploit. And that's why I think there's this nice link to the US and, and larger firms using data on knowing which markets to actually uh, serve here. Uh, Max? Oh. Matthias, uh, yes. I, was, I was wondering, when you talk about aggregate and economy-wide effects, did you also take a look at public R&D in the sense that it might substitute for some of these distributional effects? So is that a pick up potentially? Um, it could pick up. We, we just looked at corporate R&D. So that's where we'll have to uh, say this is all corporate. Again, if then there's some substitution that could be going on. Um, but it's at least not, for example, uh, correlated with uh, public R&D funding of corporate firms. So that's something we looked into. Uh, but that it could still be that kind of there's a shift there. Yeah, we wanted the explorative uh, type of research, yeah. Okay. Uh, John. Yes, I like, so I, I remember an older version of this paper, but like getting to your distributional effect, yeah. like there's a whole old literature, is it better for larger firms to innovate versus smaller, and then you just buy, acquire innovation versus yeah. in-house. So are you, gonna, are you gonna push something about that the innovation of the larger firms are less innovative or are le like, is this kind of like, are they killing off type of in yeah, innovation? Yeah, I, I, I would love to do this. Um, data limitations keep us with, with showing this. Um, I think if you, if you want to make that link, it's, it's exactly kind of seeing the link to what Ufug was saying about if innovators go from small to large firms, which is the, the reallocation we would mm -hmm. be seeing here, uh, then often the large firms make them less innovative precisely because they just want to keep out competition. And I think that's why, in some sense, this type of concentration among the larger ones, it often looks like they're just wanting to keep out others. One, one piece of evidence we have along those lines, which, again, however, you can also interpret differently, is that patents are actually going up because we know larger companies tend to patent more than smaller ones precisely to keep out competition. Just And that type is going up all other measures of innovation are actually, if anything, going down. So it suggests that this story of just trying to protect my turf, and if I'm a large company, I can easily do this through patents, et cetera, that this is going on and that it may actually then on, ag uh, on aggregate be harmful. But I want to stick with the economy-wide effects. It's really completely unclear here from what we're doing. Uh, the distributional effect, however, I think nicely comes through. And then there's, uh, like you ended, uh, I'm, I'm already going for There's more research needed yeah. exactly on that on that part. Um, Namit. Maybe, uh, can I ask one question about the, the distributional effect? Yes. Uh, so it's, it's, it relates to the setting, right? So in, in the, the European setting, where you observe variation is, is uh, in, around this, I mean, I know that your variation comes from the cross-section, but it is variation in whether like $20 million companies disclose or you know, $10 million yes. companies disclose, right? So it's, it's not like it's not the $100 million companies that are disclosing. The larger companies is what, at least what we'd consider large, by US standards, they always disclose. 
right? So yes. So, so I'll, I'll, I'll get it exactly. So one, uh, on the next slide, I'll conceptually talk about why I think this even works without this institutional quirk. And then uh, I'll introduce the institution for everyone, and uh, then we can talk about how that affects it. Like, we've, we've looked into this in, in the review process. We got kind of pushed towards that, too, and we've looked into it. And I think we, we found that it's not necessarily if the, if the regulation is higher or lower that this matters, because that would be how many are actually above or below. Uh, but but it's, it's really more that uh, what we're capturing with this, with this difference is if you're larger, and that's where we're getting to my conceptual points here, if you're a larger firm, we know you're uh, having greater incentives because you have more stakeholders out there to publicly disclose. So you will not be affected much by the direct effect. But the indirect effect, you benefit a lot from because if you're a large firm and see a small firm is profitable, profitable you can go in and compete. If you're a small firm and see, again, like Apple is profitable, you can't benefit much from that. And so there's a natural economic reason why this is happening. And that's why um, even if you petition about high versus low thresholds, so where you would say some are really just large versus uh, and always have to do this, uh, this doesn't seem to come through. So I think this is an economic story going on here. But again, um, the institutional setting may play in there. But I, I think actually this is, uh, I, I wouldn't see it as the, the main point. So to get everyone on board here, uh, briefly, um, what's happening, you can think of this as there being a direct effect, forcing the firms to publish their reports in some repository that everyone can look at. And we know there's lots of literature on this should come with financing benefits because now there's reduced adverse selection and information asymmetries vis-a-vis -vis your capital providers. But as Jerry pointed out, while well, the companies themselves often, if they don't do it voluntarily publicly, they, they say, well, I'm actually concerned about these proprietary costs. And as we discussed too with uh, Jin Wan, uh, those map into reduced incentives to innovate um, because if you have less rents from any kind of innovative activity, even if it's just finding a local market, uh, then ex ante you have less incentives to do this. Now, this means the direct effect is not 100% clear here. We have pluses and minuses, but then uh, one firm's loss, of course, is, can be another firm's gain because it can be all these competitors, customers, suppliers looking at these financials, and that's where it comes in, as John was, was making a paper about all these spillovers. And so we need to uh, account for those indirect effects, um, and here the information spillovers would come in. So we have indirect, direct effects, pluses, minuses, so that means the net impact is quite unclear. The distributional impact, irrespective of how the regulation is set, um, is, however, likely um, that the larger firms are less affected by it in terms of costs, for example. Why that? Again, they would not be the ones that are directly affected here because they already voluntarily report. And so they mainly are the ones that are indirectly affected, and they are also the ones that can take advantage of seeing other firms' information, uh, while the, the small firms couldn't do that. So distributionally, if anything, we would expect this to, to um, benefit the larger more then uh, it hurts the small firms. Now to get everyone on board regarding what the institutions are. Um, so we're looking at this in the European setting where uh, the financial reporting regulation mandates uh, limited liability firms. This is both private and public uh, companies to prepare and publicly disclose a full set of financial statements. Again, these are financial statements, no patent data, et cetera. Uh, so it's more about your financial returns. Um, each country can set, however, exemption thresholds to uh, reduce the burden on smaller companies, especially smaller private firms. And so these size thresholds are related to total assets, sales, and employees. And here comes uh, Nemet's point. The, these two out of three need to be uh, exceeded to be uh, fully regulated. And then you're a, a large firm that would always have to at least uh, do some kind of reporting, so only if you're below, you shouldn't report. Um, but we'll essentially use the variation in between that some of these uh, firms that are within their industry among usually the top 5 to 25% of companies that in one country they have to report, in another they don't. And so that's the type of variation. And among those will then, uh, and, and, and many of those will exactly contribute to what's going on there. Also, of course, then the top 5% that are always reporting, but this is part of kind of this, this reallocation that's going on. A key feature about this regulation is that while the thresholds are set at the country level, they impact industries differentially. Why? Well, a given labor um, 
threshold affects labor-intensive industries differently than um, other industries, similarly with the total assets thresholds and the like. So that's something that uh, hopefully affords us some identification later. Just before getting there, uh, a quick view on what institutionally these disclosures look like. So this is a UK company. Um, I intentionally took one that is not very innovative uh, because you can find innovative companies. We have BioNTech, the, the German uh, COVID vaccine producer. You can look at their private filings when they were still private. And there you also see a big change when they uh, grew above the thresholds. And there you see a lot of innovation activity and, and their uh, information about it. But it even works for normal companies uh, like this kind of construction company uh, or the surfacing company. This is a UK example in 2014. It says, look, we file abbreviated accounts because they were below the thresholds. What they're filing is one page of an auditor report, one page of an abbreviated balance sheet to the effect of current assets, long-term assets, current liabilities, long-term liabilities, and equity, and then one page or two pages of notes. So this is really not a lot of information. And unlike larger public companies, you wouldn't then get much information about them. Yes, you can go to the websites and scrape that type of information, but these real financial returns, you often wouldn't get that easily. Now, what you see here then is the next, next year, uh, the same company is above the thresholds and files the full report. So then you see this MDNA type disclosure. They have to talk about their strategy, their company information. They have a full profit and loss account, so they show their profitability. They have a full balance sheet, and they have 10 pages of notes. So substantially more information that, in particular, about these smaller companies, you would otherwise very hardly get, um, at least publicly. All right. So how do we want to use this in uh, a design? Well, we're, in essence, running a cross-sectional diff and diff design where uh, you can imagine we're having the amount spent on innovation in the German automobile industry, and we're regressing that on reporting, which is the share of companies in the German automobile industry above Germany's uh, country thresholds. And uh, the nice thing about this is we can include this country year fixed effect, meaning we can look at the same country at the same point in time, precisely because a given country's thresholds affect industries differentially. So that's the first nice part. Of course, you would still be worried that at the country industry level, there can be lots of factors correlated. And a first order one is something like a reverse causality story where if you just have more growth, so you have more innovation, you have more companies above the threshold because they're growing above it. To get around that, we're using the simulated instruments approach where in essence, we're using the same firm size distribution for the automobile industry in Europe for UK, Germany, France, and just compare, in essence, if the German thresholds were applied to this fixed uh, firm size distribution, how stringent is this relative to the UK thresholds relative to the France to isolate the regulation versus variation coming from endogenous firm size changes and, and the like. All right, with that said, let me show you some tables. Um, so here is the main uh, first table, uh, but Joachim. Maybe, uh, so when you go back one slide, so about the time structure. Yes. So you, I think you, you use one year lag, if I can see this correctly. So now, at least some, in some countries, actually these reports are filed with quite a bit of delay. So in Germany, I think it's, it's overall more it's than a year, almost a bit, one and a half More than a year, years. yes, yes. So, so, and then you have, of course, the, let's say the other firm has to actually enter the market. So is this a story that you say, it's all in anticipation, or is it, that, no, that, no. Uh, that the, there's really learning going on. Yes, so the key thing here is that this is a cross-sectional design, so we're mm -hmm. not exploiting the time dimension so much. We still want to align it reasonably in one cross-section, so that's why this lagging by one year is okay. I think lagging by two you, you can uh, justify based on the institutional design. But basically the key thing is the thresholds are very sticky, so we're not using that they're changing a lot, and that's why then uh, in the cross-section that really doesn't come through. It's more equilibrium results that are holding here. And my question was more related also to the, to the general economic intuition of what might be going on in terms of yes, uh, but know, I, I, there are mimicking. So there yes. indeed, it's like they, they see the financial reports and see wh how profitable they are, et cetera. So we have some evidence of people having these downloads and seeing whether they look yeah. at it, et cetera. We, with Marx, we had something uh, not for the competitors, but we saw it for the banks, and that's all conditional on the information being out. And we, we have one setting where we're actually pushing this in Germany. And you only see as soon as it's disclosed that they're 
the fact afterwards kicks in. So we have one time series uh, design here too, and there you see it's after the disclosure. So it's all conditional on that information, which I think fits fits uh, the story we're but, having Matthias, here. can I just like, make one comment? There's one thing that I want to make more generally a comment that I think is really cool about this design that you know Matthias kind of innovated this through the accounting literature and through his thesis, is because it's cross-sectional, you should think of this as basically looking at this once companies had the chance to adjust along all margins, right? You can you're basically looking at the equilibrium behavior of this in the cross-section. So it's because these thresholds have been around for a long time companies had the chance to sort of adopt and adjust to this environment, and then you're looking net-net, is there sort of more or less innovation, right? And to me, that's actually a really cool feature for something like innovation, where you think some of these things could be pretty slow moving, and our normal workhouse, the workhorse, the diff and diff, isn't potentially gonna work as well here. All right, uh, let me briefly uh, make a bit of headway here so that we're all on the, on the same page of what we're finding, if we're now looking, this is the our highest level of aggregation, country industry level where industry is two digits. And on spending, you don't see much. Uh, economically and significantly, it's, uh, it's a small coefficient actually. Um, but once we're looking into innovating firm, which is the share of firms in the industry that say that they had some innovation, that's at least going down. In terms of the magnitude, uh, it's not large. Compare it to, for example, going from the German automobile or German manufacturing industry to the Belgian manufacturing industry is about 10 percentage points change in how many firms are actually forced to report. That would uh, result in a 1.2 percentage points decline in the share of firms saying that they're innovating, which is about 3 percent relative to the mean. So that's not large. Uh, it's reasonably plausible. But then the question is, is this because reporting regulation just doesn't matter? Or is this because there's lots of stuff going on beneath this, and that's exactly what we investigate next. Uh, the first thing we want to di disentangle is a bit, I had this direct versus indirect effect, so the spillovers that John talked about on uh, others are reporting and I can benefit from that versus I have to report and others see what I'm doing. To get at that, we're in essence throwing in now this customer and supplier reporting, which is just our way of through input-output relationships getting at how many other firms that you're related to are forced to report, and so that's in essence the spillovers now. And if you look at it, then the spillovers, they are quite positive, so if others have to report, that's good for your innovation activity. If you have to report, which is now the reporting uh, part here, that's negative, and substantially more negative. So that means after, or uh, before allowing for offsetting spillovers, from you benefiting from seeing other industry peers, uh, the direct effect is actually quite substantial, so proprietary costs here seem to be coming in uh, quite a bit. All right, so the next part then that I definitely still want to talk about uh, in the spirit of this conference about the heterogeneity is we've seen now on net not much going on, but uh, the direct and indirect effect is going on, so then the question is who's actually gaining, who's losing? And so for that, what we're having, thanks to the micro-level access, we can split by firm sizes, and this reporting now is, in essence, the outcome for small companies report, uh, and them being forced to report. And there you see innovation now, if anything, is negative, And they're losing, in total, lots of innovating firms. So this is now not the average, but the total to show you uh, the numbers a bit more. So they are the ones that are primarily hit. Um, relative to that, medium and large firms, they're spending more. And so that means, for example, in combined terms, they're actually, in, in relative terms, spending more than the uh, small firms are reducing in percentage terms. And that can explain why, on aggregate, we're not seeing anything in terms of the spending. But if you look here on the number of firms, it's reducing for the small firms, less so for the medium, and less so for the large firms. But still, even among the large firms, we're seeing fewer firms innovating. Because even some large firms with over 250 firm, uh, 50, uh, employees don't necessarily have to report according to the regulation. And so that's why even they are losing. So overall, it's primarily the small firms losing out in terms of innovating, in terms of where the money is uh, that is spent. It seems to be concentrated among the larger ones. A nice thing that I don't have time to show you is that we go a bit into mechanism exploration. And there is some data on what do the companies say about barriers to innovation. And the small companies say, look, I, a barrier to me now is that they're large dominating companies. So that's the proprietary cost concern. 
Uh, they're saying what's less holding me back now is information on markets and technology because I'm seeing that. And those concerns about large companies, they are lower for large companies, so they're not concerned about it. And the benefits of seeing more information about markets and technology, that's larger for large firms. So that's the, exactly this type of heterogeneity that we're seeing, which is consistent with this story that it's the large firms that can take advantage of this indirect spillover effect and take then uh, away uh, the, the, mon uh, the money or returns from the small, uh, small firms. At, the, at this point, I can take a couple of Please. questions. I think, Nemet, I, I let you wait there for a long time. Yeah, I promise I'll shut up after this. But <laughs> All the, good. Uh, the, I just, I, I'm hoping to understand this. Uh, the, if you, from, your, from your design, the, the, the variation, so the reporting variable, the proportion of firms that, that report, the variation is coming from these companies that are within the five to 15, 20 million dollar range companies, right? Uh, so no, then, no th this is only one, this is one uh, threshold. And so you really have to exceed two out of three thresholds. So you're usually a very large company if you're ex exceeding two of the Most companies in this 50 to 250, they're still not regulated. Many of the 250, they're still not regulated because you have large companies that are large along one dimension, uh, but not so large along the other two. So that's why we're, we're still having variation along in, in all of these. And this is not purely the, the regulatory thresholds. That's an important point here, so that, and thanks for uh, bringing me uh, back to this, uh, this split in small, medium, and large is not the same split that the regulation does in terms of you're small and don't have to report versus you're medium or large no, so, and have to so report. That, that part I get, it's, uh, it's just that the one interpretation, and, uh, and I'm hoping this is not it, so, so that's why I'm hoping you can tell me why it's not, why, why my thinking is wrong, is uh, it seems like the regulation is affecting the disclosure of firms that are somewhat smaller, say under $50 million <coughs> along two dimensions. Uh, so then naturally, it's only those firms that will experience any cost, whereas the larger firms, say the billion dollar companies, they always disclose. Yes. So we do not observe. But this, but this is the, in economic, economics too, like we have that paper with Marx and Katerina, you see this for large, larger firms, they're disclosing voluntarily. Even in the German setting, for example, there we're not we're not having any size thresholds there that matter because not, not it wasn't in enforced. US, though, right? But the even US. there, you saw that the largest firms were disclosing beforehand; the smaller ones weren't. So they voluntarily do this. That's why I'm, I, I like really like to stress that this is an economic force, and this is something that's very important for understanding any types of these regular disclosure regulations. They primarily fall on the small ones precisely because they don't have the incentive to do this voluntarily. Not, not and this US is a key for understanding this, really. But in the US, we don't see large firms disclose large firms. There, there are some spillovers from the large uh, private uh, public firms that, for example, reduce their incentives there. And even among the larger firms, in, in, we have some data on that uh, with alternative disclosure measures. You see larger firms are disclosing more in our website paper, et cetera. So this is happening. It's, it's not uh, like I would not over, um, kind of overestimate what we, what we know about private firms in the US because that's very little, especially in accounting. All right. So just briefly on this uh, last part, we have this, this part um, on also having a time series design where exactly this, this type of uh, only the larger firms have to do this always. This is not given here. And in the same setting, which uh, Darren used first um, and, and showed that, for example, there you also have this type of predation that uh, typically larger firms take things away. We find exactly the same thing. Now, however, for example, we're also finding this for innovation spending. So this is the timing to uh, Joachim's point earlier. It really just kicks in after the disclosure comes in. And um, this now is negative even on spending because in this design, we're not aggregating up anymore. We're in the same country, so we go more detailed at the county level. And this is really capturing the many small counties where you would have these niche market producers that absent the disclosure, wouldn't do any, the mandate wouldn't disclose. Now you observe them, and so you take their rents away. Consistent with that, we have nice information on returns to innovation. And uh, there we see that they are going down. So the companies are saying they're making less sales from innovations, less sales or less cost reductions from improvements and the like. So this is all consistent with the re uh, reduced returns to innovation. What about financing? Well, yes, financing is a key driver why you would want to disclose, but that's exactly why you would do it voluntarily. 
And that's why, by revealed preference, those that we are forcing here are not the ones that think that their financing benefits will exceed the costs. And that's the selection that was talked about before here, where in the US, you have that pu public firm segment where people can select in, while here in Europe, you can select out of that disclosure if you have a certain size, and that's the, that's the one where we're then forcing those that really don't see this as net beneficial to report. Um, other measures, again, with patents, I briefly talked about it. It's not perfect, but uh, to conclude, the reporting regulation can stifle innovation. Uh, the aggregate effect remains unclear, but I think there's important distributional effects which are precisely because the, of the economics, not so much because of uh, the regulation itself. And so I think that that is an important one that uh, we need to uh, work more on exactly on the implications for then the aggregate. Uh, so thanks a lot for the attention. I'm going to try this out. Oh. I think I can go one way. I can't go back. Oh, this way. It would be great if someone invented a go. clicker that you couldn't go back. <laughs> that would be <laughs> All right, I think we're ready for our final session or our final paper. We're very lucky to have Jerry Hoberg from USC present his paper with Gordon Phillips on um, filling the private firm void. As with the other sessions, Jerry's going to take about five minutes to start off, and then we'll open it up for questions. So thank you so much. I really wanted to thank the organizers for uh, having us uh, have the pleasure of presenting this research. It is extremely preliminary research. We really welcome a lot of comments, but I'll say uh, the project itself has about two stages here. One of the stages is a lot of technical work to ultimately develop a new data set that this conference already well motivated. There was a question earlier in John's presentation about can you classify private firms as to what industries they are in? And this project is really squarely about that at a very, very large scale of about 800,000 private and public companies all using a common methodology based on websites. So I'm going to present some of the technical aspects which are further along. And there actually is a paper that we have on that. It's an earlier paper. And, and so you see a number of co-authors here. I wanted to acknowledge all of them. Uh, we have on the team, on the technical side, we have computer scientists, and this is an NSF-funded project, including Craig Knobloch, Jay Pujara, and Luika Rashid. The second aspect of the project actually delves into the economic side. So we're looking at things that are not unrelated to some of the issues that were already talked about here. For example, spillovers. How does the presence of a large number of private companies in your industry, in your local product market, affect ultimately uh, the public firms, for example, that are in the same markets. So that's uh, ultimately where we're going, and uh, look forward to any comments, et cetera. Uh, Gordon, by the way, is watching us by live stream and hopefully taking a lot of notes. Um, <laughs> so a little bit of background. So we're going to be talking about industry classifications. and. And when you think about industry classifications, just about everybody in this room, I imagine, has used them in their research. They are ubiquitous. So many theories in accounting and corporate finance go right to the core of what is your product market. And the interactions really exist within those markets. So it's a very important thing to nail down what is market definition. When we look at the earlier days, uh, everyone is very aware of SIC codes and NAICS codes. And they've been around 100 years or so, and were really developed originally through making phone calls and rooms full of people trying to figure out, uh, just using their own heuristics, where companies operate. The history of, of this project is we originally, in, in a first wave of work going back to 2016, but actually back to 2010, 
wanted to use textual analysis to really better identify which companies are in the same market. So the first project, which is going to be very important to understanding the current project, was one where we took SEC filings, take the item ones, describes the business the firm operates in, parse out that text and that text alone, and then we use the textual analysis to represent companies as a vector in a product market space. And the idea is if two companies have a similar vector, they use the same vocabulary, they are in the same industry. So everything here is done at the dyad level. We think about firms as competing if they use a lot of overlapping vocabulary. Now, the new project that I'm talking about here today uh, takes the same framework, but we modify the input to be corporate websites. The key thing about corporate websites, unlike 10Ks, is that they're available for public and private firms alike. And we can dramatically expand the ability to model product markets in this way. So taking those as input, what I want you to see is we put them through a very similar pipeline. So some of you might be familiar with the work in 2016. What I'm really trying to advocate here is we, we keep the framework fixed because it has a lot of advantages. So the new WTNIC, which is what we refer to the web-based TNIC database, has a similar methodological foundation and therefore similar advantages when it comes to research flexibility. One of them is that the idea of market definition is a continuum. An SIC code is zero or one. So companies exist, they can be partially competitors, they can be a little further away and have complementarities. And ultimately, you have a full spatial representation of the product market, like what you see here. This is a picture of the US economy. And you see things, for example, like energy companies in yellow are tightly clustered. They're all very similar. But when you get into, uh, over here on the left, information technologies like tech companies, they're actually very spread out. And there's a lot of differentiation there. So you can model a lot of the primitives that we think about in IO in a very continuous way. The other advantage that's going to be very crucial both to this data and also to the new database is that we redraw the network every year. Websites we get every year since 2000 because they're available on the Wayback Machine. So we have a time varying approach to modeling industry classification. So uh, just briefly, a, a lot of insights have come from this work over time, and I, I can't really do it justice on a slide, but really uh, thinking about who merges with who. We can think about innovation and how it affects the product offerings, because we redraw the network every year. We literally see the product offerings evolve and the concept of product market fluidity. Uh, we can look at how rapidly that occurs. We can measure things like economies of scope in terms of the product offerings of a firm and how wide they are getting over time. And, and of course, look at things like stock return predictability and a whole array of various outcomes. Uh, this data has been on the online, the earlier data, that is, the regular TNIC data from the uh, 10Ks has been online since 2010. Um, and it's been downloaded by uh, about 50,000, or at least looked at by about 50,000 users on the web, uh, international uh, industry users, government users, and so on. And, and we think that because the key issue here is that industry classifications are just so ubiquitous to uh, the kind of work that we do in accounting or financial economics, but also for practitioners. So now moving on, now we really want to focus on, on the new work here. So we're talking about corporate websites. This is the WTNIC data repository. And so let's think about scale. The public firm repository has about 5,000 companies a year. That's CompuStat. Well, now we're going to gather corporate websites from Capital IQ and Orbis and CompuStat, as many as we can get. And by the way, if any of you are aware of additional repositories for URLs, corporate websites, send us an email. We will try to inc incorporate them as well. But based on the data that we found, we have about 800,000 public and private firm websites that we're modeling dynamically over time. So we see them once a year. And so we can actually model the IO of the private firms and the public firms in the very same spatial model. But you think about scale, 
An industry classification is a network. It is a pairwise network, and that's true for SIC codes. It's a zero or one if the pair is in the same industry. It's true for our text-based networks. And so everything scales quadratically. So look at the numbers, 0.5 times n squared, 7.5 trillion network edges are in this database when you reflect the fact that it's time varying as well. Now, I'm a finance professor, and I've done a lot of NLP, and I try to use it as best I can. But this one, the scale of it is over my head. So for that reason, uh, you can see that the approach to this project includes uh, computer scientists from, for example, USC's ISI, where they do a lot of work on DARPA grants and uh, NSF grants as well. And so I think that as we get into the challenge that this uh, you know, conference is trying to push us towards, that you know, getting into the private firms, it's a really big problem. And I hope that more and more folks will consider you know, cross-disciplinary teams to try to put these types of projects together and uh, really hopefully uh, have, have a lot of impact. Of course, uh, it's a very preliminary project. But let me actually show you what it entails a little bit, just by example. So if you take a company's website, okay, what we're going to try to do is figure out your products. And so you look at Tesla's, and it, it actually is a, quite a nice one, really, because you, you see uh, they have their actual products nicely laid out. So our approach is we go into the website, not just the home page, but three or four levels deep. We follow the links. We gather all that text. And I love Tesla because all you see is products. If every website was like that, I would have finished this three years ago. <laughs> but thanks. Uh, if you like Elon, I like him more after seeing that. But now, not every website is like that. So if you look at Starbucks, well, you see things like culture and value, careers. This is not product content. These are very free form, and every website is different. So our goal is to try to figure out where is the product content in a really general way when we're dealing with a data set that's just all over the place. Um, these are very important concepts, but they're not what we're trying to measure when it comes to industry classification. And of course, there's a discussion of ESG as well. That kind of content is on websites. And in a further expansion of the project, by the way, we're also hoping to triage and categorize the content in websites other than the product content. But in the current project, let's keep it to products. Uh, that's our first objective here. So Starbucks, I do love the coffee, but I don't like your website, at least from my own utilitarian perspective. So here's, where, here's the landscape. If you look at enough of these websites, what you really start to see is that there is what I would consider to be a strong verbal factor structure. So if you study asset pricing, I love factor models because there's ways to categorize things that are in the covariance matrix in a nice quantitative way. And factor models also help you eliminate, right? You can, you can regress on the factors and take out the content that you don't want. So the idea here is that we're going to recognize there's a lot of content in these websites that's really informative, but it's systematically present. And we're going to try to use the analog in a textual analysis sense to say, hey, there's a factor model here. We're going to try to pull out a lot of these uh, content varieties here. But look, what we want is number seven. We know it's there, and we're going to try to focus on that and see if we can come up with some NLP methods to extract it. OK, so here's, you know, you want to take a stab at it. So we started with the model of, hey, we have an amazing team of computer scientists. We have NSF funding. And we can look at some of the, the greatest and best NLP methods and just throw them at this problem. And, and life will be good, right? So we see it as three steps. The first step is you have to say, look, you take each company and you have to represent it. What is it really? And all of these methods here on the top are various ways of doing that, where you're trying to represent a company ultimately as a vector uh, in a spatial model like what I showed you before. And these methods vary in terms of the quality. They have a lot of history in computer science for which one, quote, is better. But when you have a new application, it's good to test many. So we, we looked at all these models. And then once you represent 
in space where the companies are, the second step is now it's an industry classification. You want to say which ones are similar, okay? Because there you go. That is the industry classification. At the dyad level, if you have the same vocabulary, that's step two, link prediction. And there's many ways to do that as well. And then at the end of the day, you just want to test your model, okay? Is it actually high quality as far as the signal? You can try to predict profitability using industry peers as one common example. But after the dust settled, we were disappointed at, in the first stage, okay, that this was very noisy. And, and the issue is that it actually detected a very high number of dyads that, that these are dyads with high similarity scores, that is the model is saying they're competitors, but then we were looking at things like their NAIX codes and just getting a lot of examples, and we found that 30% of them seemed like they were clearly off the mark, like for example, uh, Exxon and Starbucks being competitors. Okay, and if you look at other networks, for example, the baseline TNIC, um, the likelihood of that occurring is just 4%, and moreover, the 4%, when you see them, they actually make sense. So we had a problem, okay? So let's go a little bit further and say, how do we fix this kind of problem? Through experimentation, we realized we have to go back to the factor model. The original approach I showed you does not recognize the fact that there's a lot of content like ESG that's not product related, that's there, but we have to take it out. So we add an additional step where we're gonna use an LDA factor model, okay, and I'm gonna show it to you econometrically, where we're gonna try to detect those additional content varieties and then try to purge them. And so I, I don't wanna spend a whole lot of time on the methods because I have a lot of econ economic results to show you. So I'm just gonna show it to you in one page and try to give you a high level view. This is the biggest, if you will, methodological contribution that we have in this paper is this slide right here, is that we're recognizing that we run basic NLP methods and they give you a pairwise similarity. We think of it as SIJ we know there's a lot of contamination in there. So what we're gonna do is take a very stark subsample of pairs that are in different Fama French five sectors. I mean, these are like really, really different sectors, right? And we're gonna build a model for how do the similarities look in that known to be unrelated set. We're gonna regress those similarity scores on the LDA topic model loadings and you wanna think of each loading as being a factor, like one could be the ESG factor, number one. Number two could be the discussion of employees that you typically see on websites, right? And if you're getting a strong result in a regression where you know the peers are unrelated, you have therefore fitted a contamination model. We know they're unrelated, we're seeing a lot of relatedness from the factors, and so all you have to do is once you identify a contamination model and fit it, is you just adjust the raw score and you take out the contamination. So the more of these topics you have that are known not to be product related, the more we're going to adjust your score to purge that content and therefore have a model that is clean in the sense of identifying products. That was a very hard problem to solve and that is the basis for all the data that I'm gonna show you coming up where we're gonna finally get into some economic questions. Thank you. So now that you, pur now that you purge it, like these measures with ESG could somewhat be orthogonal, no? Yes, uh, yes, it's, it's sort of like a regression residual yeah, yeah. type of a methodology, correct. So Is that then, a problem? Well, you're, we shouldn't be using that if we're considering about like ESG scores and sustainability then. So our objective on the current research is just to figure out product market relatedness based on actual revelation in the web text of what you sell. So if there's an ESG discussion in the website and it's making the similarity higher, I want to take that part out. Now the ESG content is independently really valuable. That's not what the current stage of research is about. That's what you could say the third wave of research that's, that's still under development but very far from fruition is about. I'm thinking about like yes. Industry composition. competition is not only kind of on the product but also on these other signals. Yes. And it seems interesting here, like Correct. the other one, it was like those seem like ESG peers that are technically not 
product market competitors. Yes. It's kind of interesting to see industry competition along the lines of kind of ESG in addition to product. Absolutely. I cannot agree more that you, you definitely have a lot of relatedness within industry that they would likely have a lot of common ESG discussions. But our focus here is, is I recognize that and I still don't want it to be part of our scores because we're going back to the idea behind the original TNIC project, which is we want to get scores that are purely a function of market structure in the sense of what you sell. There's many ways you can build relatedness networks. One could be based on what inputs to production you use, which, by the way, is how uh, NAICS is thought to be constructed. But our approach in TNIC is to literally just try to focus on what you're selling, the output of the firm. And we're trying to stay true to that here. Of course, more variations with other content could be constructed. And in fact, um, we still have the raw scores. So uh, we can actually use those models and look at how they perform in economic tests to see if there's actually a difference. Um, OK. So the next thing I want to show you is the final step of the technical work here is that we want to analyze just how informative are corporate websites. So to put it into perspective, the, the first test that we want to run here is, is simply taking from CompuStat, this is going to be a test on public firms only, just to get us going here. And we're going to regress profitability like ROA for a focal firm on the ROA of your peers. If an industry classification is high quality, you should get a high R squared because firms in the same market should have generally highly correlated profitability ratios. If you do this for SIC codes, you would get an R squared in the neighborhood of 25 or 26 percent. And to give us a little more benchmark to understanding what's good or bad is our work uh, back in 2016 showed us that if you go from, let's say, SIC codes, 25 percent R squared roughly, and you just use text instead, that you already get a sizable improvement. That that using text primarily, we think, because it's a dynamically updated data structure. SIC codes hardly ever change in CompuSat, you may have noticed. But firms actually evolve in their products quite a lot. So we have a lot more explanatory power. And this also shows up in, for example, asset pricing tests. And if you want stronger momentum, you can use a text-based industry definition, a whole host of arrays. But now, now, the more interesting part for the current discussion is what happens with the website. So that's going to be down here. And you can see we run many different methodologies. And, and the first thing I want to show you is that we were actually pleasantly surprised that the signal we got is about the same as what we got for TNIC, which comes from 10Ks. One uh, final point here is that we, we also found along the way that we can improve TNIC further by using, instead of the original TNIC, which uses a bag of words approach, we can use doc to vec and we can get the TNIC to be even better. So we're going to be revising some of those data structures to have more informative industry classifications for public firms. But what I wanted to note is that websites, therefore, I want to be clear, is that websites, while we can get a better signal than SIC codes, and we can match the original TNIC, it is still true that among public firms that 10Ks are the most informative. You see the 47%. The 10K is still more informative for public firms. Websites are a bit of a challenge. So what our goal here is to say that we're, what's different about WTNIC is that we can apply this methodology to private firms. Okay, Even though a 10K might be a little bit better for the public firm repository, there's no horse in the race for private. And that's really one thing that I know is of interest uh, to folks in this room. So the starting point now is that I hope you see that we have a classification for private firms that has really good promise. Question. Jerry, just one quick suggestion or thought. Um, <clears throat> if you think you did ROA here, but if you really want to see what's a good measure re related to industry, if you think about like the standard DuPont decomposition, we break ROE down to ROA and leverage, and you break ROA into profit margins and asset turnovers. What's interesting is if you go down that decomposition, industry fixed effects R squareds go up. Hmm. So you you might I know this isn't a key part of what you're doing here, but if you really want to identify identify industry, things like profit margins, inventory turnovers, asset turnovers are much more related within mm -hmm. industry 
relative to ROA and ROE, which has much more within and much less within industry correlations. Yes. So maybe a more powerful test when you think about what are what are like firms, if you kind of work your way down that. Yes. Thank you for that comment. And, and Gordon's writing it down as we speak somewhere out there in the ether. Um, really appreciate it. I wanted to add, though, that in the 2016 project, we did something along those lines, but not exactly what you said, where we looked at actually a basket of about 15 CompuStat ratios, and we compared the TNIC to SIC, and it's across the board. Every single one, we have an R-squared improvement of about 40%, and they, they vary to some extent, but it's always higher. So um, even when you showed the Tesla website, a lot of when you look at the website, you know they're selling cars because of the pictures. Um, mm -hmm. And it seems like you could use a lot of the same architecture that you've developed once you go past, once you go to the first vector stage, but perhaps using that for other types of data other than text. Have you yes. It, it sounds like you probably talked to one of our computer scientists. <laughs> when they saw this, they actually brought up that idea. And I was like, I'm a finance person, and that's beyond my capability to try to pull that off. But actually, they say it's possible. Uh, but it's, it will require more, more data work and uh, development. And hopefully, we'll be able to do it someday. Was there another question out there? Yeah. OK, yes. Yeah, and that, that's why uh, having larger teams with computer scientists, I, it just, it's game changing. I could not, we could not have pulled this off even close. Uh, okay, so moving on, another, another test that we run, again, just to look at quality, let's just kick the tires a little bit more. This one also is within the sample of public firms. The last one I'm gonna show you, then I'm gonna go into privates, is just to ask the question, what is the percentage of time that a focal firm's NAIX code from CompuStat agrees with the, with the uh, most common NAICS code that we see in your peers. Okay, if that number is very low, it's clearly you're kind of missing something and that you don't have a very good classification. And so in general, just wanted to show you we get similar results in that uh, with the TNIC, we get about 66%, and with the web text, we get about 69 of course, an improved TNIC could bring that up to somewhere in the 70s, right? And that's something we're going to do. So we're, we're going to have better data for public firms in the near future. Uh, but of course, I think the more exciting thing right now is actually a high quality network for private firms as well. Now here's the real acid test, okay? And this was hard because to actually test the network in private firms is hard because for the very reason we had this discussion earlier during John's presentation, there's not much data out there as a ground truth to classify whether you can even uh, have, a, have a good job in, in classifying industry for private firms. However, there is some data. Uh, what we found is that Orbis in particular, one of our data sources, has NAICS codes for a lot of these private companies. So we run the same test I just showed you, taking the focal firm's NAICS code, this time from Orbis, for private firms only in this particular test and saying what is the probability that the peers that we found using textual analysis on average have the same NAICS code, right? And so I was actually uh, very surprised because I'm always a skeptic, right, that I thought private firms would be really, really noisy in their websites, that we got this number, 67%. Why is that important? It's because of what I showed you on the last page. It's in line with our accuracy rate for public firms. So if you think private firms have really noisy websites, this is within the margin of error. We're getting a similar success rate uh, for the public and private. And that, that, again, is the key contribution here is we want to argue that we can do this well uh, for both types of firms. So now, uh, question. So yes. Um, so this, this particular test, uh, what we're actually trying to do is hold fixed that we got the two-digit right and see if we can get the third. So thank you for asking that question. You would have thought those numbers were lower to try to predict like the sixth digit because it's so rare. They're much higher than yes. The yes, and I'll, I'll have to look into that. You're right. Why, why is there more degradation uh, from 69 to 34? 
I, I want to ask our, our programmers what the difference in, in those is. I'm not fully sure. I didn't make that table. But you're right. That's something we want to check. 15 minutes, perfect. Um, we were really focused on the, on the two-digit, where I know the methodology is, is unambiguously the same across these comparisons. Um, OK, uh, moving on. So now I want to shift gears and talk about economic tests. OK, that's all the methodology. And, and the idea is we're, we're going to start to do some of these uh, things that, that are like what you saw already today, but, but different. We're going to be asking the question, when you have a lot of private firms in your neighborhood, and that mass is changing, you're a public firm, how does it change your corporate finance policies, your economic performance, innovation, those types of questions? And it, it is a very endogenous setting, as this particular picture shows you. So the, sur the surprising result to me is if I just take a correlation coefficient, this is like associations, nothing, no controls, and say, is the profitability of a public firm higher or lower when you have a lot of private firms around it, positive. I mean, you think about having a lot of competitors may, should make you less profitable, right? But the orange is above the, the origin, so don't worry about the left and right. That's just varying granularity of the network. But it's positively correlated, so the more private firms around you, you seem to be more profitable. But the blue shows you that the more public firms that are in your market, the less profitable you are. So, there's, so there is something different about public and private firms. But you, if you think about the reasons for that, you can come up with a lot of endogenous stories. And so let me, let me delve into the economics and talk a little bit about how we're trying to wrestle with endogeneity in this setting. But the idea is the question is, how are public firms impacted when you have a lot of small private firms in your network? And so through substitution logic, you would expect lower profits. You can also think about complementarities and that there'd be acquisitions. You can think about innovation. If there's a lot of private firms around you, you're going to innovate more to try to escape the competition. You can think about secrecy, right? Those private firms might be reading my disclosures, and maybe I'm going to be more secretive. So these are the types of outcomes we're going to be testing, and we're going to be using the network. And we're going to be using two sources of plausibly exogenous variation, the first one being R&D tax credits at the state level because we do have the state for each of the private firms in our database. We can see if your private firms are more exposed to R&D tax credit changes. And also, we're going to look at real estate values at the state level as well as a shock to the plausible amount of liquidity that the private firm owners have. If your real estate goes up a lot, uh, this has been used in uh, Cheney, Srayer, and Thesmar. And the other one, of course, uh, Bloom, Shankerman, Van Rienen as well. So, so let's delve in. So the idea is, is that we're thinking about an identification, and, and, and this picture shows us uh, the approach, is that uh, if you have a focal firm, let's say here in New Mexico, uh, we want to look at all the other private firms that we identify from the network as being your competitors, and we're going to basically compute the average real estate value across those peers and the average uh, quality of the R&D tax credits, and then look at how those types of shocks affect the policies of the focal firm. OK, so the regression approach is, is very simple. You've seen these models all the time. These tests is going to be based on public firm panel. So firm year, this is only public firms, because that's where we observe a lot of the left-hand side variables. But the key right-hand side variable is going to be the average tax credit or the average real estate price of your private peers. OK, so this is where the private firm data is coming in. We're going to include, of course, firm fixed effects, time fixed effects, and some basic controls. This is extremely preliminary work. Uh, we're still improving the network, so uh, don't cite it yet. Uh, but it's not even in a working paper out there yet. Was there a question? I just want to make sure I understand. You're using variation across states at R&D tax credits for the private firms. Is that right? That's correct. And are a lot of these private firms LLCs instead of C-corps? So in, in the uh, Orbis and Capital IQ data, I would imagine you should have variation of that sort. Uh, but it's something we can explore yeah. more. So it flows through to the personal, the R&D tax credit flows through to the personal tax returns of the folks who are the investors in the LLC. Is that right? Uh, I'm, I'm not exactly sure, but I, I would think so. This is something that we should look up. Is, is there a reason for? Well, 
the I'm question. Not, I'm curious, just in terms yeah, I'm not of sure if I, how I, that it would. It may not matter. I'm just trying to understand. Yeah. So you're trying to get at variation from the company's point of view, the private company's point of view, and how useful to that company the R&D tax credit is? Yeah, so we, we want to think of it as a shifter to your propensity to do innovation as yeah. a private company. S so I guess it just, it probably doesn't matter that much. It's probably just, yeah. in a way, it might be better, like when it's the LLCs and the top personal tax rates now are way higher than the corporate tax rates. I mean, maybe what matters more <laughs> is actually uh, the variation between the C-Corps and the LLCs, perhaps. And the yes. Corps. But anyway. So we, we, I, you know, Gordon's logging the comment. That's a great comment. I want to think about that one as well. Can we even get that information from... Uh, capital IQ or Orbis and do something with it, we would love to do it. Let, let me uh, just show you some results. So again, we're looking at both of those shocks and we're going to look at a whole host of outcomes, right? It's preliminary work, but let's just see, see how it pans out. So here is our first set of results. We're using the average R&D tax credits of your peers as the key right-hand side variable with the firm fixed effects. And so what we see is that the focal firm, not surprisingly to me, actually is negatively affected when it looks like there's the private firms in your neighborhood are seeing a lot of benefits to becoming more aggressive innovators, right? That the focal firm, the public firm, uh, has lower uh, operating income to sales, OI assets, lower sales growth, lower asset growth, and even lower valuations. Uh, consistent with the substitution, uh, and, and this is really what we've seen in the public firm results using TNIC as well, that the more competitors around you is probably not a good thing for your performance. But remember that the raw data showed us a different correlation, so controlling for the endogeneity does seem to matter. So now we're going to look at uh, investments here, and we found nothing for acquisitions. Uh, the R&D result is not surprising. We're shocking the R&D of your private peers, so the public firm is doing more R&D. Not surprising, uh, but we see uh, crowding out of CapEx, and we see less debt issuance. Here we look at competitive variables from the public firm's perspective. So uh, the product market fluidity is the firm turning over its products more. This is a measure that Gordon and I developed with Prabala in 2014, and absolutely. So the public firm seems to be changing its product mix at a higher rate uh, when you have these private firms in your market. Uh, we see that the total similarity among the public firms declines suggesting that you're investing in product differentiation, which is consistent with the idea of trying to escape the competition through adding product features that are unique uh, to your own uh, offerings. So a couple uh, unique variables that we also wanted to build in this setting because, again, the, the interest in private firms also extends to thinking about venture capital entry. And the idea of secrecy, are these firms becoming secretive, uh, two new variables that you may have seen, we've used uh, the concept of venture capital entry measured this way in other papers, but what we're doing is we're, we're going into uh, the venture expert database where each of the venture capital finance companies has a verbal description of its product offerings. It's about a paragraph, not a lot of text. And we're looking at the venture-backed companies that are closest to each public firm and then measuring what is the total amount of money you're raising, right? So the idea is for each public firm, we can see if you're, being, you're in a market where there's a lot of venture funding coming in or just a little. And that's going to be one of our dependent variables to see if these private firms are inducing more venture financing in those markets. We also look at secretiveness following a paper I had with Max in 2015 where we're looking in the 10K for the firm discussing issues, for example, about using trade secrets instead of patents or do they have proprietary information being revealed directly as something that they see as a risk? Uh, so the idea here, those are the dependent variables. And so we see that when you have more of these private firms in your market, you do become more secretive. And we also see that venture capital financing seems to be crowded out. Most of the private firms in our web database are not venture-backed. We have 800,000. These are mostly non-venture-backed, right? So uh, when, when their numbers increase or they have more R&D tax credits, it appears to crowd out the venture-backed uh, companies uh, relative to the public firms. So one more shock, and how much uh, time do I have left? About five minutes is perfect. Um, okay, so now what we're going to look at is the real estate shock. So we're looking at, again, the same geog geographic representation of the market, and we're calculating the average real estate price increases
in the markets where the private firms are. And the idea is that it should be a positive shock to the liquidity of these private companies so that they can grow faster. But it's different uh, philosophically than an R&D tax credit because it's not really an incentive to innovate. It's just a general shock to liquidity. So we, our thinking when looking at this shock is that the results need not be the same. The, a shock to liquidity is not the same as a shock to innovation. So uh, let's just take a look at what the results are. And, and on, on the first set of results, when we look at performance, we see um, negative results. So the, here the results largely echo uh, those of the R&D tax credit. The more you're giving liquidity to the private firms in your market, uh, the lower is your OI sales, OI assets, and the results become insignificant for some of the other variables. When we look at investment, here we see there's a higher uh, rate of M&A. So those firms are growing faster, potentially becoming more complementary or interesting M&A candidates, uh, likely to the public firms. And they also do more R&D, and they do more equity issuance in this case. Okay, so other dependent variables. We also see higher product market fluidity. So you shock the liquidity of the private firms. These public firms are turning over their product portfolios faster. However, a very different result comes for total similarity. For the R&D tax credit, we see the public firms investing in product differentiation, becoming less similar to their peers through innovation. But for the liquidity shock, we see it's a positive result for total summary. It's very interesting that those two results are diametrically opposite, consistent with there being more of a flight to homogenous products in the face of a liquidity shock that's not about changing the product itself like innovation is. Um, when you think of it that way, it's not as surprising that you're not seeing uh, the innovative result. Um, just a quick question on... Um your measure is continuous, right? So you can dial up or dial down how close you are drawing from your private peers. Is that right? That's correct. And do you do that here and get that, and these results kind of magnify or reduce if you expand or contract your definition, or how does that work? We actually didn't yet, and, and we should, and we will. Uh, literally, I was putting these slides together after the very first set of tests we run, and I'll say that the granularity we did is a 1% granularity. So we're taking for each public firm, uh, we're taking all the private firms that are 1% most similar in general, and we can therefore look at your neighborhood in that sense, which is about the same resolution as SIC4. So it's sort of a somewhat tight market that we're looking at. A related question, you mentioned neighborhood. Have you thought about literally thinking about neighborhoods? Do you take, are you able to scrape geographic data off this? What we have is the state, and that comes from Orbis. So, and, and capital IQ. Uh, but the answer is yes, websites typically have uh, the location, but we have not actually put in the effort to try to pull that one out. Um, but it hopefully would agree with the Orbis data, but that remains to be seen. How stable is the peer group? So, in, in general, in these networks, you see substantial changes. Now, I don't know the autocorrelation here, but for when it comes to TNIC data, even the 10Ks, you see that the probability of not being a peer next year, if you are this year, is, is, is about 25, 30% chance you're going to leave. So the turnover is quite substantial. One out of four, one out of three will leave the network next year. When it comes to websites, I would probably think that the rate of turnover is even higher, but I don't have the statistic here. But Yes. Exposure is changing depending on the turnover, right? Yeah, so that's one of the things we're still thinking about is how to decompose it through the change of composition versus the change of real estate holding the peer group fix. We, we haven't done that yet. Again, very preliminary work, uh, very possible some of what we have here will change over time. But I wanted to show you uh, that, that we're you know, starting to build out some of these tests, and it is very early. So moving on. Uh, secretiveness we didn't find in, in the real estate shock, but we also see a crowding out effect for venture capital entry. And so um, I think I'm just about out of time. So just uh, the disclaimer I really wanted to emphasize is these uh, results are extremely preliminary. We do not have a working paper out. And I love the comments. We have a lot of work to do. Um, but uh, we think that the project has made enormous progress, especially on, in terms of the data quality and building the network. 
And uh, you know, we still have some additional quality control items that we want to work on before we make the data public. We want to make sure that it's very reliable. Uh, so give us a little bit more time on that. We also want to try to do some forward extension. Right now, we have coverage 2000 to 2016. Uh, but these things take a lot of time, unfortunately. Uh, but we are working on it. So the conclusions here is that we extend the baseline TNIC network. Uh, we're covering about 800,000 public and private firms in the same, uh, if you will, market structure, spatial model that's dynamic and time varying. And the goal is that we had to separate the product text from a lot of other diverse website text was really a difficult technical challenge that we believe we've overcome. And so the network overall looks to be as informative as the baseline TNIC network. And, and so it, I think as a measure of private firm relatedness, therefore, can have a lot of utility. Um, OK, so in terms of economic results, very preliminary. preliminary but we see that private firms really uh, look like they do affect the public firms in their markets quite a lot. And we have a lot of power to test that because the network is huge. It's sort of like market microstructure is one of the great fields to be a researcher in because the data is so large, you can get very sharp results. Hopefully, uh, we, we, we hope that corporate finance can become that way too uh, because the large number of observations you have in this setting. But in any case, uh, we see somewhat different results when we shock firms with R&D incentives or liquidity. Um, but admittedly, uh, certainly it's true, the project is still in an alpha state. So uh, we appreciate all the comments. Thank you. All right, thank you, Jerry. Very, very fascinating stuff. Um, I assume Gordon is back home running those regressions now. Um, <laughs> So this brings the conference to a close. I can't say thank you enough to Lincoln International for being the cocktail sponsor, um, for uh, Phil and the Chukasian Accounting Research Center for the support that they've given to this conference and to bring this uh, very fascinating group of people together. One very important person I want to thank, this wouldn't be done without Jen Hensley here, who... Uh, I, I can tell you she's going to get some well-deserved rest this weekend, I hope. Um, so box lunches are outside. Thank you all very much for coming. This was great. Appreciate it.